Welcome to episode 19 of An Understanding. This one will be about Rutherford B. Hayes. If you like it, listen. If you don't, eat biscuits. Hope you guys enjoy. The Battle of Antietam. He received a promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. Rutherford B. Hayes, Lieutenant Colonel, would return to his unit, the 23rd of Ohio, as he is leading his men in the Battle of Antietam. His specific regiment will come under heavy fire. I wish I could do sound effects a lot better. But ultimately, he is undaunted, unfazed. Lieutenant Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes is a bit of a fatalist in a lot of ways. If he dies, he dies. But under heavy fire and seeing no other avenue of escape during this very vicious battle that is occurring, one of the deadliest conflicts within the Civil War itself, he leads a charge straight at the Rebel line that's firing upon them. The Rebel line will fall apart, but very briefly, they're very daunted. Fighting ensues, and twice more the men will continue to charge charge regroup charge regroup and fighting is fierce it is very brutal and after the final charge twice more again rutherford b hayes feels what he described a stunning blow he has been shot in the left arm up just above the elbow right into the humerus he falls off of his horse he loses a lot of blood and makes it just feels weak. He's crawling uh, to some sort of shielding that is behind him. Or that is behind uh, uh, the, the, the troops that are charging as the rebels continue to fire. He's weak. He feels fainted. He lays down for a quick second. A couple soldiers are there. But ultimately his men start retreating. And they start leaving in droves. For a moment, he feels really confused you know he's he's trying to give commands even though he's going in and out of consciousness and he continues to try and uh, attempt to move um to better position so he can call out to his men but he realizes there's no one else there a lot of his men have already left and being their commander pinned down under heavy gunfire from both sides one's men are reloading their their muskets or not their muskets but their guns and weapons Rutherford B. Hayes, in, in, a, in a brief, silent moment, yells out to his men, Hello, 23rd men! Are you going to leave your colonel here for the enemy? A couple of his troops come and rush him off. They carry him. He's in a lot of pain. And they rush him off into, basically, the, the camps and the quarters, uh, some distance away. The surgeons immediately... Uh, begin working on him. One of the surgeons actually ends up being uh, his brother-in-law who dressed the wound. Rutherford B. Hayes will close his eyes and pass out. When he awakens, his arm fully bandaged, probably some nerve damage, some hurt, and some pain. Rutherford B. Hayes will survive. His wife Lucy thinks he's dead. He gives word that that he is alive and very well and fine. No infections or nothing severe. Rutherford B. Hayes is going to survive the Battle of Antietam. He will survive more battles. He will be attacked numerous times. He will be the only president who would actually be injured in actual combat uh, in this country's history. He would be hurt numerous times throughout the entirety of the Civil War. And Rutherford B. Hayes, facing death on many occasions will eventually become this excuse me become this country's 19th president of the United States of America. Rutherford B Hayes is going to be this country's 19th president of the United States of America and he is a interesting individual. He's going to be the first in just generally speaking a series of presidents who will participate within the Civil War itself. Uh, many of these men, notably the two, his two successors, um, James A. Garfield and Chester A. Arthur, um, he actually served with William McKinley himself personally um, as you know the, the 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 next generation of post Civil War men who will lead this country uh, in whatever particular direction that they're going to lead him in. Now, Rutherford B. Hayes is 
a fascinating individual. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about it for, well, I'm going to talk about his entire life, but um, he's a complex person. Um, you know, you read some of the books and you read just who he is and it's really conflicting um, in some aspects of just the kind of character that he is. And it's really difficult. And I think it's because, you know, I see him, he's just like a really introverted person and you know, like when you meet some introverted individuals and people, you kind of just don't know what they're thinking about, and it's really difficult, and it's really ambiguous, and Rutherford himself is just, just like that. But at the same time, he just shows a lot of characteristics of someone that, like, you know, he's just old school. He's really naive in some aspects. You know, he's kind of like the person that's like, you know, if that one girl shows me all that love, I'm a lover forever kind of thing, you know? It's kind of, there's 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 an innocence to him, which I, I think is, is interesting and enjoyable. I mean, he seems like a pretty honest man, although I think, you know, the more I, I read books, I read more about these people and individuals, and things aren't as clear-cut as they usually are. Rutherford B. Hayes is a Republican, and he will fight for the Union uh, during the Civil War, facing and really being a part of quite a few battles, to be quite honest with you. He's going to be a fascinating governor. He's going to be a fascinating politician. And ultimately, and unfortunately, he's going to be a part of one of the biggest and just worst um, decisions in this country's history, which is the Compromise of 1877, um, which ultimately is going to lead to the, the... really the the second aggressively disputed election within this country's history the the first i think being the election of 1824 with andrew jackson but this one really takes takes the cake for me you know they stole it from jackson but this was basically just this set the country back especially in the south for a hundred years in terms of uh black African American civil rights and just in general, um, just the atrocities that will occur because of that. But I'll get to that when I get to uh, Rutherford B. Hayes and uh, in, in, in his presidency in the election of 1876. Rutherford B. Hayes will become president um, as a weird candidate. He's a bit of a middle ground kind of individual. Um, I don't know, like a modern equivalent to him, uh, honestly, would be. Um, He's just like he's just only well known um, in his particular states, uh, but he's kind of some notoriety. So I guess like if Gavin McGinnis, for instance, if he was a Republican and not a really all over the place kind of governor, um, you know, might get the nomination kind of thing for uh, his political particular political party. I guess it'd be like uh, Bill Clinton in a lot of ways, where it's kind of like just kind of comes out of nowhere. He was the governor of Arkansas at the time, you know, like. And, you know, he has some positive notoriety to them. Um, but the main difference is with Clinton is that Clinton was much more charismatic, good-looking young man at the time. And um, Rutherford B. Hayes was just like, you know, and just really went on of his, uh, went based that off of his, uh, his Civil War record, his military career, and ultimately just, you know, his a relative attempt at objectiveness within, when it comes to politics and the whole political game. He's going to be president during a very uh, interesting time within this country's history. Technological advancement and industrial revolution. Like, Thomas Edison is going to be the individual, like, he's going to be doing all his inventions during Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency, you know? Like, and I think it's interesting to look at history the way it, it unfolds with certain guys being a part of these guys at certain presidencies. It's like, oh, okay, so he's, like, around that era. You know, the country is really moving towards that direction and you know i think it's really interesting and he's going to help really facilitate a lot of it at the very least when it comes to uh certain economic pressures you know cowboys and indians is really going full bore around this time and i think a red dead redemption to a certain extent uh with some of the things that happens uh during tech in texas and mexico and you know just in that general area that you know outlaws you know all that stuff's really kind of recurring around this particular time in this country's history you know this is going to be i think um a weird episode because you know hayes i you know historically speaking hayes is just a milk toast president he will only serve one term by choice and ultimately is one that i think historians agree and don't agree on in a lot of ways um most people kind of put him as a below average president some will actually say that you know he 
by all accounts, is actually a pretty solid president after all the things that he has, he's, that he's going to have to deal with, you know? And the spectrum really goes all over the place, to be honest with you. And I, and I actually agree with every single argument, which is why I think he's going to be an interesting president. I think there's a lot of things with him that say he's a good president, and I'm just like, okay, but there's also this that makes him kind of like, I don't know. And personally, I have apprehension of trusting any form or any politician, to be quite honest with you. And, you know, with Rutherford B. Hayes, there's, n- there's no exception. So with Hayes and his legacy, you know, I-, I take a step back and be like, is this who he is? Is history honest with him? Or, you know, are we just being lied to? Or, you know, is history, you know, perceived perceive very differently in some way, shape, and form? You know, and Rutherford B. Hayes, it- it's-, it's kind of all over the place. Um, you know, like he's someone that's like, I, you know, one book or one you know, research paper would be like, I, you know, he, he was, he was going to help the Underground Railroad. But at the same time, too, it's like, you know, and he also, it's very clear he didn't think black people and white people were as socially equal, um, you know, as as much as most people would probably think. But I think, even, like, even, like, he's not a radical Republican by any stretch of the imagination, if that makes any sense. You know, radical Republicans were the much more equal rights no matter what and at all costs, you know, straight up abolitionists and all that, and all that jazz. The whole point being in this long tangent before we get into the whole childhood and his entire life story, he's going to be someone that I'm just going to feel conflicted about, you know? If I had to make my own president rankings list, and again, I don't, I don't think you should write rank presidents or really do anything like that and i i I might write a book about this one day but i'm not gonna rank presidents and for him i just don't know where i would put him to be quite honest with you and i think it's really difficult to really assess that um he's one that could be pretty high and i'm not gonna blink an eye and he's one that could be really low and i'm not gonna blink an eye and i'm gonna struggle with that you know like personally for me like it's very clear certain guys are gonna be in certain places I don't think Franklin Pierce is going to be any higher than, you know, bottom five. You know, I don't think Jackson, for me, isn't going to be any lower than top five. You know, like, you know, the it's with Hayes, I'm not going to be shocked in any meaningful way. He's going to do things that he's going to have to do. And you can excuse a lot of the things. But at the same time, in a much more modern interpretation and personal influences aside, you know, he could be much lower because... You know, it could be for political reasons. And I think it's also because there's just ambiguity with who he is personally for me. I think I know who he is to an extent, but he's always going to be in a bit of an enigma for me. And I'll, and I'll explain when, when we get to it. But, you know, without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start with Rutherford B. Hayes' childhood. Rutherford Burchard Hayes Jr. is going to be born on April 4th, 1822 in a uh, new uh, house, two-story brick house on the northeast corner of William and Winter Streets in uh, the town of Delaware, Ohio. Not the state of Delaware, but the town of Delaware, Ohio. His family histories on both sides, I think, are very interesting, and just like a lot of individuals, it stems from you know hundreds of years prior um his on his father's side they are uh new englanders specifically uh, his family settling um first i think in vermont and then effectively uh, uh in connecticut or was modern day connecticut in particular they are of scottish and presbyterian descent at least on his father's side and his father Rutherford Hayes Sr. ultimately is a really interesting fellow. He would die, I believe, 10 weeks before his son um, was born, unfortunately. He would die of uh, a really strong and intense fever that would ultimately end up killing him. Um, and his history goes back, like I said, you know, many generations. And it's, 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 it's interesting. He actually, um, living in Vermont at this particular point in time, moved to Ohio in 1817 with like seven eight thousand dollars and is like i'm going to be this staunch businessman and invest in everything so he moves to to that town of delaware in ohio and basically uh, goes to farm goes to trade which and ironically which a lot of books ultimately end up saying it's ironic uh, is investing in a distillery which is interesting because uh, future president uh, rutherford b hayes jr and his wife were notable for not having any liquor in the White House uh, whatsoever. And it's interesting. 
um, he ultimately ends up becoming someone that is very religious, but also a really big, strong supporter of education, really secular education, meaning he just wants everyone to, to have some semblance of education. Um, but like I said, he dies right before, excuse me, Hayes is, a, is born. Um, his mother, Sophia Burchard, he's named after both parents, um, is uh, a descendant of old New England family, old uh, New England money, uh, I guess you could say in a lot of a lot of ways, um, from England all the way back again to the 1630s. And um, her father, Roger, was born in Connecticut, was a merchant, and did a whole bunch of mercantile stuff. And um, when he died... Uh, along with her husband, she inherited a whole bunch of stuff and a whole bunch of land in the Delaware area where the house that Rutherford B. Hayes is going to be born in is ultimately going to be born. And Rutherford B. Hayes is born, uh, he had a bunch of different nicknames, but the one nickname that would always stick with him, family and friends would call him, is Rudd. At first, uh, the family was financially tight. Obviously, when um, his father ultimately ends up dying, they were um, it was it was a bit of a financial pinch, I guess you could say. They were short on some resources, and when Rutherford B. Hayes was born, you know, they didn't have a lot of things despite having a big house. It was quite empty. Didn't have a lot of furniture. You know the the chairs and the wood floors aren't fully finished, and you know it's it's very modest um, to be quite honest with you. Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, technically speaking, would have uh, three older siblings. First, uh, a sister uh, who had died uh, previously when she was uh, before he was born, and a brother um, who died while ice skating uh, when he was nine. The, the only sibling that he would have uh, would be his sister, Fanny. And she is, by all accounts, you know, the ultimate protector, confidant, nursemaid, and best friend of Rutherford B. Hayes. I mean, you want to talk about, um, you know, one of the most, you know, emotionally competent siblings and great sibling friendships, I guess you could say. Rutherford B. Hayes and his sister Fanny ultimately are, you know, one of the top two, of uh, one of the top, <laughs> I guess you could say, sibling friendships of all time for a president. Um, Hayes' mother... Um, uh, Sophia uh, ultimately is gonna basically do what she can because she's a boss and uh, ends up renting out part of uh, the land that she effectively owns now because of uh, uh, the inheritance from her father and then her, her you know now as a widow her her former husband and ultimately ends up you know gaining a modest income but ultimately uh, along with being supported by. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes' uncle, uh, Sardis Burchard, who really becomes, in a lot of ways, a, a father figure uh, to Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, his uncle, Sardis, is this lifelong bachelor and really stern and really competent businessman and banker. Um, he is the one who ends up taking charge of a lot of things for uh, Rutherford B. Hayes' education, um, notably. And basically ends up becoming the closest thing to a father figure Rutherford B. Hayes is ultimately going to have. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes and his mother are going to have a, a very interesting relationship, but ultimately a pretty strong and stern uh, relationship. She would basically just be a really good person and really wanted to do everything that she possibly could for her son. Um, because Rutherford B. Hayes, you have to understand, is often a very, very sickly child. He was always really sick um as an infant growing up it wasn't until he was probably about maybe two three ish that um you know he would basically start getting a little bit better and his older sister fanny would help out and a lot of the nurses uh, a lot of people that they would just come and you know rather be hayes was a very you know loved child in relative comparison to a whole bunch of uh, other individuals and other people you know now, despite, um, you know, them living modestly, you know, they weren't by any means, um, you know, financially or economically, um, I guess in one book, say, in a pinch by any stretch of the imagination. They lived pretty well for the most part. And growing up for Rutherford B. Hayes um, was really good. You know, he loved um, the surrounding area that he was in. It was a pretty rural area in Delaware by this point in time. Um, and despite a lot of the economic effects from the Panic of 1819 occurring, which is the whole reason why um, 
uh, the family moved to Ohio to begin with was was they saw the economic decline happening, uh, especially you know after the War of 1812 and everything's trying to catch up to them. He effectively um, loved a lot of the things that were happening. He would he and his family would go to the farms that the the family was renting out, um, where a lot of the tenants there were basically like, "Hey, what's going on?" And you know when Easter comes, um, they would get sugar, pet birds, rabbits, turtles, and get a whole bunch of different eggs. And you know he he's learned a lot and got to meet a lot of different people. And also just really enjoyed traveling. He got to travel a lot. Um, the, the, the the actual house that he lived in was very, was relatively speaking, pretty far away. About 15 miles away, I believe, from the actual f- uh, farm uh, that they had actually owned. And Rutherford B. Hayes loved to do a whole bunch of different things. And always played with his sister Fanny, who a couple of books tend to describe her as you know a, a tomboy in relative comparison you know she could ride and shoot a gun as well as any boy you know and they would just play together and do a whole buzz of, bunch of recreations climbing trees they played chess they played chess a lot um and both obviously love to read because everyone loves to read because there's no tv back then Rutherford B. Hayes and his sister Fanny like I said before would have this great lifelong friendship as uh, siblings Ultimately, she taking care of Rutherford B. Hayes, who's always he's always gonna be frail, pretty thin, pretty pretty quiet, uh, growing up at the very least. But he's always very close to her, and she helped take care of him along with her mother, who's a valiantly strong, independent woman. Um, really nursing him uh, during his ill days, and when she herself would be uh, sick, he would take care of her. And they, there's a bunch of stories of um, him giving her rides uh, on the sled during their recovery. And for uh, a very uh, brief time, her mo- their mother, Sophia, they taught him to read and write, and Fanny in particular was it was very, very bright. And, you know, they would always talk to each other, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, about, you know, all the things that they would just love to read about, mainly uh, uh, Shakespeare plays and specifically poetry um, by the, the, the gentleman, Sir Walter Scott. Um, for a little bit of time, uh, the mother... Sophia would have to leave on occasion um, in order to actually take care of their sick uncle, in, in which case they would basically board with um, friends and family, notably uh, a man named Tom Wasson, who became their, their guardian for, for a little bit. Now, Wasson, uh, who was basically, he's basically like their neighbor in a lot of ways, uh, ultimately ended up uh, sending them to the local school district for, for some time, where they were... Um, uh, Taught by what they say is a Yankee schoolmaster named Daniel Granger, who Rutherford B. Hayes describes him as a demon of ferocity with pierced black eyes. And the, the specific schoolmaster was n- notorious for his floggings, and at one point, it went big or small whipping them. Uh, at one point, Rutherford B. Hayes notes, um, that a knife was thrown his way well, while he was talking to, and <laughs> to his sister Fanny. Um, basically, they just feared for their lives and constantly begged to to be taken out of school for the most part in every sense of the word. And when his mother, when when their mother returned, she's like, "What the fuck are you doing?" And basically just said, "You know what? Screw you guys!" and took him out of the school. In which Sophia, uh, by the time of 1834, when Rutherford B. Hayes is about 12 years old, uh, Rutherford takes what will be the first of a series of trips that he would endeavor uh, upon his life. He loved to travel, and specifically uh, would begin his lifelong love of traveling by traveling all across New England. Now that the family was much more financially stable uh, in a lot of ways, the the mother uh, getting a lot of income from a lot of people lodging, uh, both in their farms uh, and certain housing uh, that they had owned, and with the financial uh, support um, of their uncle, uh, Sardi, or if I can't pronounce his name, Sardi uh, Burchard, um, ultimately as this, as this great banker um, in the New England area, uh, the the Hayes family really experienced really a strong fine again like I said before you know they weren't poor by but they lived by modest means but they weren't poor by any stretch of the imagination by this point in time financially they were pretty sound and secure 
so the Hayes family would be able to, to travel uh, frequently, and they would travel uh, specifically all around New England to various different states in Vermont, Massachusetts, in which he, he loved uh, visiting many times. Uh, at one point, they would uh, visit his uncle in Lower Sandusky, um, uh, another uncle, and I, I believe, because I think uh, Uncle Sardis was, uh, uh, although he lived quite a bit away, he was still a very, really prominent father figure in Rutherford B. Hayes' life. But throughout, he, it, it's always noted that Rutherford was always impressed by the superior intellect and the abilities of all his uh, female Hayes cousins over, uh, you know, the male Hayes cousins, which I do think is just a little bit fascinating. Um, and Rutherford, after uh, growing up specifically, would attend, I guess you could say, would be the equivalent of uh, a high school, a new school, the, the Northwalk Seminary in Ohio. In a lot of ways, this could be considered a high school. This, this, this specific seminary was a little bit different than what most colleges were back then as uh, the education system's really starting to change throughout the entire country. His sister, Fanny, uh, would also be attending uh, a female-run academy. So with the uh, the financial support of his uncle Sardis, he was able to, to attend, like I said, the Northwalk Seminary. It's this Methodist school uh, run by the Reverend Jonathan E. Chaplin. Um, Hayes, although being sent away with his family, uh, he loved his family very much and was very close with them. Um, really, and really miss his sister every day very much. Um, really enjoyed it for the most part. At least, in, if you want to, then again, if you want to compare the previous schooling that he had before versus this, it was you know night and day much better. Um, you know, a lot of books state that. Excuse me. He was never phased uh, by his studies. In fact, a lot of his teachers uh, would always say that you know, he has good sense. He is respected and esteemed in his companions. In a lot of ways, he's kind of just like a good boy, at the very least. Very religiously drawn. I mean, one of the, the first essays that he wrote while he was at Northwalk Seminary in particular was a, an essay on liberty. Um, on the same day he was speaking, uh, he delivered a eulogy on Lord uh, Chatham, uh, another person uh, himself. And in the next year, after he was in that seminary, he transferred to uh, another school, Isaac Webb's uh, School in Middleton, Connecticut. He actually met a, met a, a couple of close friends, uh, his friend William Lane, where he studied uh, Latin and Greek. Um, and, and this is where, in a lot of ways, uh, Rutherford kind of gets a lot of his discipline from. You know, because you have to imagine a young kid who's, uh, I don't want to say shelter is probably not the, the right way, but if you want to compare, you know, the lives of men who weren't forced uh, to be as disciplined, I think, uh, in relative comparison to a lot of, uh, you know, like Andrew Jackson is someone who's going to be forced to live day by day and Rutherford B. Hayes didn't really have to, to fear in a lot of ways in relative comparison to a lot of these younger and poor presidents uh, just just in general poor presidents um, you know it, it, it's, a, it's a much different dichotomy uh, between the rich and the poor and it's always going to be but um, for Hayes it was it was a little bit difficult he, he struggled at first to keep up with his classes being bombarded with you know Latin, Greek um, mathematics, anything everything and you can think of specifically as uh, uh, that academy in particular was preparing him for for college specifically that being said you know he adapted and and i think he had the the structural foundation to be someone who was going to be very very disciplined he really started keeping up with his classes um and you have to understand you know uh, and well and he got really along well with the the school's director as well you, know, you have to imagine, you know, it, it, he gets up at 6, 6.30 in the morning, he eats a small breakfast, says his prayers, and, uh, you know, goes to class at 8 or 9, and, you know, dinner uh, was always at noon uh, in particular, which I always find pretty strange, and, you know, on the, on, on the weekends, he would take long hikes and also study French, apparently. And he was really uh, successful in a lot of the, a lot of the things in, in that endeavor in particular. So despite having a very prominent, um, I guess you could say, relationship with uh, the, the main director, who was um, the guy, uh, Isaac Webb in particular, who, who wrote the thing I just said, uh, he had a good sense, he had a, a favorable character among us, there was a belief um, 
at least in Webb, that he wasn't prepared for college uh, by this particular point in time. He was about 16 years old, and you know, despite excelling in many meaningful way, the the rigorous studies of that college would uh, be forced upon him, and the I guess you could say the broadened horizon that he was going to have to really accept um, was very uh, he worrisome for Webb. Anyways. Hayes himself uh, convinced his, his, his uncle, who was helping uh, finance a lot of the endeavor uh, in particular, basically just saying, hey, Uncle Sardis, can you can you do this for me? Because I'm pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm very anxious. And ultimately, his uncle's like, this, this young man's capable. He's ready. He can do this. So ultimately, Hayes will leave uh, the academy and will go to Gamblier, Ohio. He's coming back home, where he enters Kenyon College in uh, 1838. At the age of 16 years old, uh, he has a very fascinating college experience. Ultimately, he's going to succeed. You know, he's focused. He's ready. He's prepared. He excels in every facet of his studies. Um, really, the things that he really improves that would help him benefit him in the future of his political career and ultimately help him really start um, in a lot of ways into a political career uh, was his public speaking abilities and his ability to make friendships and he had a really solid experience throughout to be quite honest with you it's also where he starts going into some debating issues and, and debating topics and debating clubs etc cetera, etc cetera, and where he makes a lot of friendships I'm talking about a lot of everlasting friendships including um, many people future Supreme Court Justice uh, Stanley Matthews a couple of congressmen notably uh Trowbridge, Roland E. Trowbridge, and um, basically a lot of people who are going to affect politics over the next, uh, I guess you could say, half century. And a lot of these people um, who are going to participate within um, the Civil War itself. Uh, and and, and this, is, this is very clear what, what's happening, too, because Kenyon, he starts a diary, uh, which effectively ends up helping him in, in his close, uh, I guess you could say, in his life. You know, he's like, oh, I remember this motherfucker, uh, yada, yada, this person, oh, I got this, you know, and just a lot, of the, a lot of these things actually help him invaluably, both in terms of just getting to know people, communicating with people, and also just being like little details, minute, even if, um, that ultimately is going to help him succeed within the near future. Uh, college overall, um, I think, is ultimately just really, really interesting and really fascinating. Um, he ends up having what I would say, well, first and foremost, let me, let me explain it this way. You know, like, education's really good. He's going to graduate four years later in 1842, ultimately, as the valedictorian uh, of his class, which is really incredible. But, you know, he does a lot of things. He creates a whole bunch of different societies, notably the philo uh, Society, which is a society for uh, literary and theater, I guess you could say, organizations where they talk about... Um, reading and partaking in certain discussions on you know f like philosophical plays you know what did shakespeare mean in this what does he mean you know when when life is like the the greatest play of all or something like that you know like it's just little things like that that, that the the, uh, the society was uh, created for and you can argue he actually tends to actually creates one of the the very original og um you know fraternities or frats of all time um it's actually back then called the friendship club it's called the phi zeta um which uh, its motto is philizo um latin friendship meaning friendship for life you know and like I said, it's around this time, too, he's, he's improving his public speaking. He's actually starting to give a whole bunch of different speeches uh, for the society and for the college uh, itself. Um, well, on occasion, too, excuse me, he would vacation on um, you know, the, the summer and Christmas breaks to visit family. And I'll be visiting um, his sister, who I believe is actually now married uh, to this guy, uh, William Platt. He's this uh, jeweler and businessman uh, where they had established their home in, o in Ohio in that particular area. And he graduates in, uh, in 1842. His, his topic was uh, college life and discussed its many advantages. Um, and when he was the, the valedictorian, he addressed the school president, um, the closeness of his fellow students in his, in his valedictorian speech. And this is also where he starts thinking about what he's going to do with his future. Once he starts leaving or getting ready to leave Kenyon in the coming months, um, 
you started reading uh, while on vacation or preparing for vacation the, the summer before uh, at the re- reading off. Uh, sorry, he began reading law at the office of Sparrow and Matthews in Columbus while visiting family and basically made it from that point on that he's going to, okay, I'm going to be a lawyer. I think that's the career that is ultimately going to help me uh, end up you know, being a prominent individual. And he starts looking at certain law schools and Harvard just tends to be the one that he's really eyeing. So remember, he ends up really, um, you have to understand back then, re- like learning law was very different. Um, there really wasn't a lot of institutions and institu- in actual institution places where you could actually learn and read law. Um, it, they weren't there yet. Harvard wasn't a specific uh, law academy by this particular point in time. or It was, but wasn't before, but now it is uh, by this particular point uh, in the 1840s for sure. But the only way you could really functionally learn law was to read for specific lawyers and be apprenticed uh, by specific lawyers. Um, and while he was in Columbus, uh, after he graduated, he goes back to Sparrow Matthews in Columbus. He started he started studying from everything, um, studying Blackston and Chillingworth, and learned German. And basically, uh, as one book I like, he understands a great deal of legal lore, you know. But uh, he he starts talking to his uncle, who's still the big father figure of his life, and an even more prominent businessman. He's basically saying, "Look, I think." I think this is a great and all, but I think this is going to take you a while, and I think you need a much more, um, what I would say is probably a systematic education, um, it, just to make it much more quicker, much more seamless, and there's much more structure to it instead of just reading various different, you know, affidavits, laws, and how the actual, uh, I guess you could say, criminal justice system ultimately works, and and just the legal system ultimately works. So. You know, like I said, he goes around, and Harvard's becoming the up and coming school, especially since you know it's the school of John Adams, et cetera, et cetera, and 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 John Quincy Adams, his son as well. Uh, his father or his surrogate father, his uncle, pushes him to go to Harvard. In which case, he's like, ah, okay. So, uh, 1843, he effectively starts his studies at Harvard Law School for three semesters. Um, he's and Cambridge, uh, Harvard itself, and he thoroughly enjoys Harvard in every sense of the word, uh, to be quite honest with you. He, he wrote to his uncle that uh, uh, the advantages of the law school are as great as I expected to find them, and the means of passing time pleasantly even greater. And he, because of his previous studies, um, he didn't have to specifically do the, the mundane routine education that a lot of people had to because, you know, it's just like any rudiment, rudi- rudimentary school kind of thing going on where, you know, you got to get your, your, your general ed kind of stuff. And it's a little bit different. Um, and it's not as rudimentary, but it's, you know, he, he has basically passed certification so that he can just go straight to law. In which case, he really thoroughly enjoys it. He gets to actually learn from some of the most uh, incredible and famous lawyers, uh, Professor Simon Greenleaf, and actually a Supreme Court Justice, uh, Joseph Joseph Story. And he really loves their their informal lectures uh, in a lot of ways, and really enjoys um, really just learning for the most part. He has a very strict routine. Uh, he rises at six, exercises before breakfast. Mondays, he would study law until eleven. German till two, which he will learn German during his time here at uh, Harvard University. And then in the evenings, he would basically write uh, uh, notes during and reading uh, Watley and Chillingworth. You know, and you know Tuesdays, uh, devote everything basically just to pure law thursday's pure law in german and then a lot of german i don't know you know he, he loved it though and a lot of his friends there um many famous orators he would he would end up meeting a lot of them from ohio uh, specifically a lot of buckeyes so he would be really happy uh, to, to join a lot of these men there uh, but ultimately you know while at harvard he got to meet and see a lot of famous people among them being like uh, george bancroft Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Daniel Webster, and of course uh, another former president, John Quincy Adams. He would leave after three semesters, where he would basically get a, an undergraduate uh, bachelor's degree in uh, in law in 1845, uh, basically ending his uh, law school career. 
Once Hayes leaves uh, Harvard, he goes back home to uh, Ohio, is Sandusky, what is, I think, today, um, Fremont, uh, Ohio. And, I mean, he was advised by his professor, Greenleaf in particular, to, to avoid big cities and, and competition for the most part. He would continue his studies for a little bit um, before he ends up attempting uh, to, to take the test for the bar and passes the bar in 1845 to become a practicing lawyer and attorney within Fremont, Ohio. <coughs> Uh, and initial goings were very, very rough. He's attempting to um, set up his law practice in a, in a lot of ways. He ends up rooming with one of his cousins um, and forming this partnership with this guy named Ralph P. Buckland, a, a future friend of his. And ultimately, um, he ends up actually, I think, uh, um, uh, representing his own cousin at one point. Uh, his cousin named Peace. Uh, wallet and other property were stolen. He successfully prosecuted the perpetrator, and things were really looking up in a lot of positive ways for um, Rutherford B. Hayes. But things were, were starting to take a toll on him and trying to set up and create a, a ravishing and dominant law practice. His health started to deteriorate, just like how a lot of people were, uh, you know, uh, feeling back then, especially. And he wasn't able to practice law as much, so he's able to really focus on politics in a lot of ways. And at this particular point in time, um, he's effectively a Whig, um, but he's also apprehensive towards you know the Whig policies because he's basically like, yeah, I don't know, you guys shouldn't have let go John Tyler so quickly. It's gonna bite you in the ass. And he's like, yeah. And ultimately, he was right because. Uh, Polk's now president, and, you know, it's around this time, too, 1846, 1847, that tensions are starting to rise with, uh, with Mexico, and with his health in, in terrible shape, he, he briefly thought about joining the army, uh, which is kind of funny, mainly because of, the, of two reasons, one, to represent and serve his country, but also to just, you know, go to a warmer climate, which I think he thought would, would really help him, too. But ultimately, his uncle Sardis is basically like, "No, you're, you're not doing that." Um, and ultimately, his his uncle decides, "We'll go to Texas. We'll go for a little bit, get some fresh air, wide open spaces." And they decide to go to Texas. When he goes to Texas, he's reinvigorated. He's ready. His health has improved. And Rutherford B. Hayes is really, to, really ready to take on the world. You know, once he returns home to Ohio, his strength uh, regained, and although he would you know really truly miss you know the, the long horseback rides and hunts that he in that he made while and friends that he made in texas you know rutherford b hayes was ready and he continued practicing law both civil criminal cases etc cetera, etc cetera. and he really starts becoming a very really talented and prominent lawyer but um two big things are occurring one he's just not making enough money and number two he wants a, a real challenge ultimately for himself um so when he returns in 1847-ish uh, and after a year or two of trying to plan out uh, an idea of what he wants to do he decides he wants to move to a big city and you know nearby cincinnati is a very growing city i mean by this particular point in time it's one of the biggest cities in ohio um probably the closer to about a hundred thousand people within that city and a lot of opportunity and you know one of his friends uh, this guy named george hoadley was just like bro you gotta fucking go there bro 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 come on let's go let's go bro anyways he decides he wants to go to, to a big city. So in uh, 1849, uh, early part of 1850, he ends up moving to the, the growing city of Cincinnati, opening up uh, one of his law offices in uh, January of 1850, uh, Third Street between Maine and Syracuse. And it's, it was difficult in the early goings. He had to wait in vain, as one of the books says, for business. Um, but ultimately, he ends up becoming prominent he ends up getting a lot of retainers which um at that time is is a little bit different than what it would be today especially price wise too just imagine having a lawyer on retainer for five dollars a month or something like that that's kind of I, I find that perfectly funny to be quite honest with you but it's around this time too that you know rutherford b hayes he's not getting any younger and he's deciding he wants to find a wife he had actually courted a, a lady earlier from Connecticut when he was up, up around that particular area, but he was very dead set on, on living and staying in Ohio. Uh, I think she failed to 
to to, to make a move up to, to the uh, the northeast. He's just, eh, I'm okay. A lot is happening for Rutherford B. Hayes uh, Byrie by the point of 1849 to 1850. You know, he's moving to a big city. He's trying to establish a law practice, which by March of 1850 is effectively just one of the most you know, insanely profitable and prominent young lawyers up and coming for the most part. And there's actually a couple of cases that I was looking up um, that are deeply fascinating. You want to, you think some cases today are insane, especially like if you go to Florida, my goodness. No, 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 no. Like people were poisoning each other back then just to, you know, like people were desperate back then to be quite honest with you and a lot of people, um, there's one case in particular that Rutherford B. Hayes is going to be a part of. In which case, the book, uh, one of her biographies, describes this lady, Nancy Far- Farrier, a deformed girl who had poisoned a number of her employers. And basically, um, although she was convicted, he, he, he does like 15 different cases, it feels like, um, where he's basically defending people who poison a whole bunch of different people. So it's it's pretty deeply fascinating, to be quite honest with you. Um, but it's around this time, too, he's starting to come towards uh, high life and high society. He joins a, a literacy club and uh, had the opportunity to both practice his oratory skills and also listen to a whole bunch of different people. It's fascinating. One of the most famous people that he ended up really listening to and falling in love with, not actually falling in love, it's kind of gay, but I'm just kidding. Um, but for the most part, like he really enjoyed listening to, and his works were uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, which he basically, ironically, found to be, you know, just interesting, but not a profound thinker. And then he starts reading his book, and he's like, oh, there, there's something there. He loved reading and loved uh, that kind of high society life. And also, too, he starts meeting a whole bunch of different ladies, you know. This lady, he ends up meeting uh, around 1849, I believe. Uh, very, very early on in, in the high society of Cincinnati life. It was this lady named Lucy Webb, but I'll get to her in just a second. But he uh, he's captivated by her. He loves her grace and charm. And she's hyper-intelligent with a college education. And they begin a very very long courtship so after he's doing all his court cases after he's doing all this stuff 1853 late 1853 uh this guy richard m cornwine who basically at this point 1853 brotherford b hayes is effectively uh, one of the rising up up and coming og lawyers he's basically like a free agent um in a lot of ways it's like I don't want to say Tom Brady, but it's kind of like if, uh, I don't know, like Tyreek Hill, for instance, on the Chiefs, decided he wanted to become a free agent. It's like, I'd love to have that piece on there. And Corwin offers Hayes um, to be one of the firm partners in one of his, prom- in, which is one of the most prominent firms, I think, at this point in Cincinnati. And after some hesitation, Rutherford B. Hayes decides he's going to join the firm. In which case, Corwine, Hayes, and Rogers' firm was launched and would become one of the most successful enterprises in uh, the, the state of uh, Ohio and Cincinnati. And anyways, um, let's just get to it real quick with his future wife, Lucy Webb. Lucy Webb um, was a very high society kind of lady. And when Hayes moves to Cincinnati, he's actually kind of got two girls uh, that he has attractions for. It's this lady named Frances Kelly and Lucy Webb. Now, probably, I don't think I've really explained uh, Hayes' personality really very well at this point. You have to understand, he's a very shy man. He's very introverted in a lot of ways. And he's I'm not, I'm, I don't want to say he's very dumb, that's not the right way to ex- explain it. I think he's naive in a lot of ways and very innocent in a lot of ways to the realities of the world and many aspects of his life, to be quite honest with you. I think he's just a good-natured person, at the very least in the early goings of his life, and very just good-hearted. And I think he has, and I think it's mainly attributed to the reality that he's always had pretty pleasant relations and always had basically been around really solid people and a really solid upbringing and didn't really have a lot of negative experiences other than you know some certain aspects of his life but um notably the his his school upbringing <laughs> i guess i mean when you have a knife thrown at you it's kind of you know uh, you know it's, it's going to change you a little bit but for the most part he's very quiet shy introverted very reserved and very thoughtful and a lot of th- in a lot of different things and i think he's a very smart and very 
I can't even really explain the specifics of it, to be quite honest, but to be quite honest with you. But a very thoughtful kind of man and individual. Um, but I think he's always going to be someone who always thinks positively through a lot of things and a lot of issues. And he's always just going to be reserved in a lot of ways, which is why um, when he does run for president, he's in, in, in comparison to what the Republican Party was, he's basically like one of the more conservative members of the Republican Party. That being said, um, you know, he's going to be a very interesting fellow. And I'll, I'll, I'll go slightly more into that when I get to the later aspects of his life. But um, one aspect of his life that is very undeniable is his love and relationship with his future wife, Lucy Webb. They would meet one day. They actually met prior, quite earlier, when uh, when they were in Delaware for, uh, for school while she was in college. And, uh, you know, they both hit it off pretty well. And I think they had a lot of similarities in their lives. Uh, she lost her father at a very um, young age and both college educated and both were really fascinating individuals. And Hayes was always shy around her, which I want to make a point is really, really funny. And, you know, they would once uh, he had his eye on her, she reciprocated it. And one of the books basically details that kind of <laughs> in a lot of it's kind of funny because he, he basically says this uh he, in 1851 he's sitting in a rush bottom rocking chair in front of lucy and he grasped her hand and said i love you and after some hesitation after he had repeated his declaration she replied i must confess i like you very well you know like it's just fascinating i point this out because every single book and every single you know, texts that you read about Rutherford B. Hayes, the one aspect of his life that is always b- brilliant and beautiful is his relationship and love for Lucy Webb. Lucy Webb Hayes, whatever you want to call her. They'd be married for the better part of 40 years, marrying on uh, uh, December 30th, 1852, and spend the next 40 years of their life together in a truly loving relationship um for the most part by all accounts you know they would have their ups and downs life and it, it, it's basically going to be difficult in certain aspects and certain points especially when he becomes uh, um president um but ultimately you know you can't really find anyone that's going to be much as as much more of a mainstay and much more of a pertinent institution within a, an individual's life you know you won't excuse me you won't find anyone that is as committed, loving, and caring, and supportive as, you know, they were for each other. And they would be blessed with eight kids, seven boys, um, and one girl. I think only four of the boys uh, would would survive, unfortunately, though. Before we continue, I just want to talk about, you know, he's going to have four sons and a daughter. One of his most notable sons, Webb, uh, I believe was a second-born son. He's going to be a great, you know, military hero. He's going to fight in, I think, three or four wars. Um, the last war when he's effectively in his uh, 60s, the World War One, in particular, uh, as in like an army general, a brigade leader, I guess you could say. Hayes is, when he is, is married, um, things are generally pretty interesting um it's around this time too that politics um really starts revolving around the hayes family and uh and i guess you could say just just a lifestyle of the family itself and i think you know religion and politics in particular are the two things that will be set forward for rutherford b hayes and um you know with his burgeoning law practice now at this point he's much more financially settled and capable of really focusing on other things which is what a lot of people you know did back then and a lot of these guys ended up going into politics and his wife grossly influences uh, his views on a lot of things first and foremost he had always been um he'd never been really a drinker to be quite honest with you um but his wife is a i guess you could say staunch um what, what, Methodist Christian, um, basically saying that, you know, good works and faith and no alcohol whatsoever, in which case um, Hayes and the family effectively ends up abstaining alcohol from the house and the, or, or alcohol. Um, and Sorry. The Hayes family effectively bans alcohol from the house, just like, um, you know, James K. Polk. Um, actually, she, get, she gets the nickname Lemonade Lucy because of that. Um, but also, too, uh, her wife's views aggressively so on slavery. You know, when he was a Whig, he had effectively had, I don't want to say milk toast um, views on slavery. He was basically like, I don't like it. 
but I'm not going to be an abolitionist. He, he thought abolitionists was were were too far in their belief and perspective uh, on it. But ultimately, his wife ends up really. Um, changing his perspective uh, in a lot of ways and i think also too because uh, he ends up being a little bit disenfranchised or feels a little bit different um about whig politics because you know he felt that they should at least be you know anti-slavery in some way shape and form although not abolitionist if that makes any sense yeah you know whig politics um every single president that they had uh, i think it, outside of millard film uh millard fillmore uh, had owned slaves Henry Harrison, Taylor, um, John Tyler especially owned slaves, and you know he had been a little bit disappointed by a lot of those aspects of their of their you know slave owning uh, reality. And I think too, um, his wife is a, is aggressively anti-slavery, abolitionist, and a lot of it had to do with his fam- or with her family, who were originally from Kentucky, um, had owned a whole bunch of different slaves uh, throughout their life, and and was a little bit disenfranchised with I think her mother's perspective uh, on slavery, um, and ultimately, or sorry, was very happy i guess you could say with with her mother's interpretation of slavery i think at one point she says um lucy's mother was advised to sell the slaves for for money but her mother was like i will before i sell a slave i will wash and i'll wash and support my i will wash to do whatever i have to to support my family yeehaw sorry that was really really rough um I can't do accents very well. um but regardless she ultimately ends up freeing the slaves and um um, we'll hire them from time to time on the farms, um, which really molds Lucy's view. And ultimately, Rutherford B. Hayes ends up becoming someone who's like borderline abolitionist, to be quite honest with you. Um, uh, and um, he ends up representing, in a lot of cases, um, a lot of fugitive slaves, notably um, arguing like argued a case uh with with future senator Salmon P. Chase and former Chief Justice Salmon P. Chase uh, in favor of a fugitive slave girl. Ultimately he ends up giving his services to fugitive slaves and actually is a low key member of the Underground Railroad, but keeps it very low key because he doesn't want his law firm to suffer. His law career is burgeoning. He's having, I think, by 1856, um, I believe his second son might have been born by this point in time. And he is thick in, you know, financial success, relatively speaking, and ultimately political success, too. He really could have joined politics at any point of his life. He ends up really raising his profile by, you know, being, uh, I don't even want to say, because at this point he's kind of Republican, but he's not um affiliated with the republican party though although he makes speeches for john c fremont and doesn't like james buchanan in any meaningful way kind of thing so but at this point he's just basically rocking it he has a really large profile and the republicans want him to, to run for office but he refuses ultimately for several nominations um in congress <laughs> although he really could if he wanted to focus on family wanted to focus on basically doing everything and really i think he felt that he could do a lot more to help uh fugitive slaves because remember 1850 the fugitive slave act is going to be put into place and there's going to be a lot of slaves that are going to be you know leaving from the south up to the north leading kansas slavery is the hot topic issue right now and he felt like he could do more on the ground i think um than anything else you know he felt um slavery itself the idea and question of slavery was you know when we're battling this it's, it's the freedom of human beings at stake you know and and basically he always argued in a lot of ways um the, the how ohio interpreted slavery uh, which was really wrong you know because there's a whole bunch of different perspectives on it and he felt like he could actually uh change at least you know through the judicial system a lot of presidents a lot of precedents and a lot of you know just the general legality of how you know slaves would would interact with ohio as a state like ohio is a free state but at the same time it's like if the south and a southern fugitive slave goes into the north it's it's that it's that issue ultimately he felt he could actually do it legally instead of getting a mob and (laughs) and stopping um you know the the military from intervening truth is though a lot of there's a lot of reasons why 
um, Hayes initially stayed away from politics. A lot of it personal. Um, the family would eventually lose kids, but you know he's got a lot of family that he's gonna basically have to take care of. And, ul- and ultimately, and unfortunately, one of the closest people in his lives, Fanny, his uh, his sister, older sister, uh, would end up dying. She would die in childbirth. I think she was um, giving birth to two to twins. Uh, both were stillborn. And that death really um, kind of changed him in a lot of ways. And it's fascinating, too, because, you know, this, you know, once he mourned, and it took him a little while, um, he was kind of full bore into politics. And it's kind of fascinating, to be quite honest with you. Because, you know, you, you look at people and you look at, you know, how tragedy strikes them. And I think that kind of tells a little bit about their character um, in a lot of ways. And for Hayes, he kind of just seemed like he was just going to work. That was it excuse me just work and you know he's just one of those people that just when it's fairly clear that something's on his mind he's just gonna put his head down and work and just deal with it for the most part he doesn't really want to talk to people and and that really hit, and you have to understand it hit him hard you know the he would I mean, Fanny, as he would say, was the big confident, confidant of his entire life and you know things were just difficult from that point on but then, you know, he he mourned, focused on his work, and really got himself, um, at least in the mindset of the political game. And I think he also wanted to basically have a much more uh, financial stability. Like, if you, like, it's one of those things that if you're going to pursue politics, since uh, being a lawyer was really um, his only source of, of income, just like Martin Van Buren, then you want to have some financial stability w- in order to actually be a politician. So when he does attempt in some ways to, to attain certain offices, he ends up saying, nah, I'm okay. Um, which is kind of funny because, like I said, if he ran for politics, being the kind of person that he is, being the high society man from Ohio and Cincinnati, <coughs> he probably could have won um, at least a state house seat, I would probably say. Um, and, you know, they feared he actually might even run for Congress uh, in 1858. Um but ultimately, um, he decided not to. Well, then he technically lost, so it kind of just like gave him much more uh, conviction to, to choose other um, avenues for his first political office. And it just so happened that the um, I, I didn't want the the city attorney, I believe, um, ended up dying. I believe uh, the the Cincinnati City Council had elected Hayes to complete the the dead city attorney's unfinished term uh, in 1858. For the most part, they had a bit of a, a Republican majority because you know it's a northern state, and you know he had the opportunity to do it. <clears throat> and he and he thought about it for a little bit. He was a little bit apprehensive when he found out that this is going to pay literally twice as much um, than and being a regular judge he's like all right i'm all for it i mean it's the difference between you know thirty five hundred dollars then to about fifteen hundred dollars a year basically it's it's a you know pretty sizable and substantial difference i would probably say and later um in 1859 he would be re-elected um for another year or two year term as well on top of that the election of 1860 is like I said before, when I t- was talking about Abraham Lincoln, a very fascinating election. And you have to understand, too, which I think is really funny, is that a lot of these guys who are going to be future presidents, you know, a lot of these men are kind of around. You know, I mean, I mean, it's going to go all the way up until at least, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and, and Warren G. Harding, probably, where, you know, these guys are going to be alive, and it's going to be really fascinating to, to really think about, you know. We don't really think about it. Um... You know, like today, for instance, there's probably going to be, you know, five presidents that are future presidents that are going to be alive. They're going to run for public office. And I think it's going to be interesting and fascinating to see how the future unfolds. But around this particular time, uh, at least in history, um, the election of 1860 with Abraham Lincoln, Rutherford B. Hayes um, by 1860 is in the Republican Party. He's a Republican, and he would be considered a moderate Republican by most standards. And In fact, he's probably one of the more popular and well-known Ohio uh, Republicans by this particular point in time. He had actually met Abraham Lincoln on uh, numerous occasions. Uh, during the actual campaign of 1860, he served as the, the vice chairman of the Republican Executive Committee uh, within Hamilton County, uh, County uh, specifically. 
and it's actually fascinating. He has during this entire time, he's a lot of books would say that he had a strange reaction um, towards the elec- towards towards the election, basically saying that you know. Hayes, after meeting Abraham Lincoln a couple times when he's the Republican nominee, professed his support, but uh, could not get could not get up much interest within the actual contest itself, which is just a weird outcome and a weird way to look at things. And I think this really stems from a couple of issues. But I think the biggest issue is the fact that he's not technically worried about the election, who wins or who loses. I think. Ultimately, his perspective, um, and you have to understand, I think he's, by this point, a pretty rational person. I think he understands how politics works. I think he understands how people work to an extent. And I think regardless of what happens, I think um, one side, I think in his perspective, one side's going to succeed. It's, it's, it's going to be the North or the South, and there's going to be a whole bunch of different issues. Violence is untenable right now, and he's just more worried about that uh, specifically more than anything else. Because when the actual election uh, is is going and processing, and he's like, "Oh, the Southern states are going to have Abraham Lincoln on the ballot." Well, cool. It looks like this might be one of those elections that it will actually have to probably go to the House. And you know, he just was not an optimistic person. You know, he. He was unable to arouse much interest, and you know, because he, he has to understand, he's basically just like the Democrats, just going to destroy this country. He hates Douglas, you know. Um, he hates basically all the Democrats. To be quite honest with you, he's not an ardent Democrat in any way, shape, and form. And at the very least, does not like what they are doing. And ultimately, after the election, Abraham Lincoln is going to win. And then the next couple of days. Things get interesting. He goes silent. You know, it's in his fascinating. A lot of um, the historical context that we have for Rutherford B. Hayes is he kept a diary. And, you know, during this time, a lot of the pages during the Southern Secession when Abraham Lincoln becomes president are really blank for quite some time. And, you know, ultimately, he I think he's thinking. I think he's trying to process everything, um, with everything that's happening. It, and I think a lot of people felt this way too, to be quite honest with you. And the reality is, is like, you know, it's when the slave states and the South secede from the Union, the, you know, it's all threats and veiled um, attempts to try and, you know, dissuade compromise and get their way. But, you know, when it actually happens, I think it's kind of just like, huh, they're actually doing it. Okay. Interesting, you know? And, you know, and after a couple of weeks of contemplation, I would probably say other issues, too. I think he's also contemplating what he's going to do um, in terms of his part in the Civil War itself. That's going to be looming. But for the most part, he understands uh, and passionately, as one book says, denounces compromise. Civil War and disunion are at hand, and I fear disunion and civil war less than compromise. You know, he f- he's basically saying that this is going to be a very long war. This is going to be something that is not going to end very peacefully. And ultimately, you know, I hope we have, you know, the the, the guy who's going to do it. And, you know, later in February, uh, President-elect Abraham Lincoln goes to Cincinnati. And, you know, they had met each other before, you know, previously. And this is before he became the president. And, you know, when he meets him yet again, he ends up basically just being like, Okay, I think this guy can do it. He's shrewd, he's able, possesses strength and reserve, you know, which is kind of uh, fascinating, to be quite honest with you. Um, Mainly because, you know, everyone had different opinions of Abraham Lincoln, but he, above all else, was like, I think he can do it. He was one of the the initial believers of Abraham Lincoln during this this really critical time. Once Lincoln basically says, it's all at war, um, it's going to happen. Um, a lot of things happen. Really, within like a four to five month span, um, Rutherford B. Hayes' life is going to substantially and drastically change. First and foremost, um, he's going to lose his uh, re-election bid for the city's uh, solicitor. He's going to try and start up um, another law firm with one of uh, his close buddies. And initially, he's going to do it until... April 12th of 1861, when South Carolina attacks Fort Sumner. 
and a lot of the, the Confederacy attacks uh, Fort Sumner. Apparently that attack in particular uh, had specifically outraged him. And, you know, you have to understand, he has no military experience. He was about 40 years old. Um, he was going to have his fourth kid. Um, and, you know, he, he felt he had to do something. So first he initially, uh, he drilled initially with what would be known as a volunteer home company called the Burnett Rifles. It's basically just, like I guess you could say, a small contingent or small little militia company that's going to basically train in preparation for combat, you know, and, um, he was like, might as well get myself ready, just in case they come here, you know, and, um, later on, though, for many, many reasons, uh, on June 7th, the governor of Ohio had made him a major in the 23rd of the Ohio Volunteers, with, where Hayes was going to start his, uh, military service. First and foremost, there's, his entire family is really split, in a, in a whole bunch of different directions. His mother's basically like, oh, this is punishment from God. Um, his mother-in-law basically was just freaking out left and right. And his wife, being, you know, as the kind of person that she is, um, is basically like, I wish I could fight in it. <sighs> Get these bastards and whatnot. And he himself has fascinating words, which I would probably say, I think, for, for Hayes, is probably one of the more famous things he's ever said or written before. Um, he basically declared, um, after facing a personal hard struggle, I would prefer to go into it if I knew I was going to die, rather than to live through and after it without having taken any part within it. Basically saying he'd rather die, not at the very least, than, you know, live and not have participated within the actual Civil War conflict itself. At 40 years old, Rutherford B. Hayes is going to join the Union Army and combat the South. Rutherford B. Hayes is going to be a number of actual presidents, future presidents, that will participate within the Civil War itself. The first is going to be Ulysses S. Grant, obviously, for <laughs> specific reasons. Rutherford B. Hayes is going to be a colonel, uh, or eventually a colonel. Uh, the next one is going to be James A. Garfield, and then his subsequent successor, Chester A. Arthur, and then William McKinley, who was going to be a little bit fascinated within this actual conflict itself. But, you know, before we get started into the actual, his Civil War life for the most part i just think it's fascinating like i said you know wars life and it's going to be just like a lot of the the presidents in the uh, 20th century who participated within world war ii uh, you know are going to be the ones that influence politics for the next excuse me for the next you know 30 40 years same thing with the civil war first you have to understand when hayes initially goes in he's going to be essentially a part of uh, the army of the Potomac. He's going to be participating uh, in a lot of these battles, um, and I will explain basically, um, at least in the in the, be in the initial beginnings of what his entire military service will entail. He will serve for the next four years, for the most part, the entirety of the Civil War. He experienced all of the Army life, the dirt, the grime, and the glory. Um, and a few weeks into it, um, he actually initially was transferred from combat to the judge's advocate's office to, to try certain specific cases, tribunals, little things like that, some captured um, confederates, you know, little things like that. That's at least what he was initially. And then he, along doing basically doing those cases, receives a promotion. He becomes a lieutenant colonel and then comes back to the 23rd Regiment in Ohio. He will then participate in a couple of battles specifically. Notably, um, he, w he, he was supposed to participate in the second battle of Bull Run, um, but no notably uh, joins the Army of the Potomac and tries to cut off Robert E. Lee's Army of, the, of Northern Virginia, which was going into Maryland, which would be uh, the Battle of South Mountain. Um, Hayes leads charges left and right. He is a brave man, <laughs> I will say that. Um, and notably, he will just continued doing a whole bunch of different things within the actual battle itself. Um, in the Battle of Antietam, which he will participate in, uh, 
he specifically and his regiment will come under fire um and again another brave man just continuing to lead many charges he leads a charge uh, several times um going against the confederate rebel lines and uh, very briefly uh takes a break after charging apparently and then goes back in two more charges and they just keep going trying to win this very bloody battle that will be in antietam he himself takes a stunning blow he had been shot in the left arm um, above the elbow and understand too although hayes is not the first president um who was had actually participated in the war he is the first to have been wounded in combat he actually is going this is going to be the first of four severe injuries that he's going to effectively have uh, throughout his entirety of the war itself he had been shot in the left arm above the elbow he had lost a lot of blood made him feel faint and he ended up basically passing out and he, after regaining some semblance of consciousness, he tried giving commands and orders uh, while attempting to move short distances to be a part of his troops. You know, his men retreated, um, leaving the commander pinned down under fire from all sides. And during the entire, or during a specific lull in, uh, in firing, apparently, he said, Hello, 23rd men, are you going to leave your colonel here for the enemy? <laughs> and his men went back for him and pulled him uh, off the field. And his uh, the the actual army surgeon, um, based thankfully the army surgeon was there, who happened to be his brother-in-law apparently, uh, had dressed his wound, which is funny too. It's just the family, it's small world, am I right? And uh, he, his family actually got word that he had died, but then they were basically told, uh, "Oh, wait, he's not dead, but we don't know where he's at." And then. Basically, they were just. Man, that, that must have been a really hectic day uh, if you're Lucy. And very briefly, she's able to go and visit and see him. Uh, in, I believe in Maryland, in the, in, the, in the battlefield for the well, not in the battlefield, but you know, in a in a hospital as he recovers. His men uh, basically appreciated everything, you know. And Lucy, w- alongside them, uh, basically just said, "You guys are all brave men for you know." rescuing my husband from certain death you know his dumb ass you know and his men appreciated the the the, the words uh, of his wife and for the most part you know basically from this point on he was always a very popular leader and always a very popular person basically someone who was just like in the middle you know the, he's rutherford b hayes is just one of those guys who's just like he just like because he no i don't really have an opinion it's okay it's whatever um you know i just just do the right thing you know that, that that's basically it i'm not really stern in one particular way shape or form you know and that, that's just kind of who he was and ultimately you know he's ultimately it's just someone that everyone's just like i like this guy i like this guy and um you know all his men basically respected him from that point on um Hayes will then eventually recover from his wounds. Uh, once he recovers, Hayes then gets a promotion. He becomes a full colonel, better uh, qu- acquainted with, uh, at this point, the new second lieutenant, which is William McKinley, which, by the way, is the only president. Uh, it's just fascinating. That's the only military regiment in history that has had two presidents in it, or two future presidents specifically in it. Hayes and McKinley. I think McKinley was a young man. He's like in his uh, very early twenties, or eight, I think he was eighteen when 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 William, when William McKinley had actually enlisted. And you know, both found each other uh, very impressive. You know, he he saw William McKinley as exceedingly bright, intelligent, promising. And Mc, William McKinley himself uh, basically just said, "Man, he is just his whole nature is incredible. He's agreeable, the generous, the gentleman of the gentlemen." intense on the battlefield and ferocious and the two actually would become very very good friends from this point on hayes once he finally recovers and becomes a colonel uh will join uh general george Cook, uh, crook whom he really loved and actually named uh, i believe his second son first or second son after him specifically and would join the army of the shenandoah which would basically effectively fight in what would be known as uh, present-day West Virginia, uh, specifically. And, you know, he'd fight on occasion. He would, uh, on occasion, lead a whole bunch of different... He would normally fight in the back, to be quite honest, and just be leading people, but at times he would command uh, a brigade and head up divisions and still do a whole bunch of different raids, uh, specifically on 
really dangerous dangerous stuff uh raids rail lines supply depots within west virginia and would participate in a whole bunch of different battles um and specifically he distinguished himself um in the, in the end of retreat after the defeat of Kernstown, he led this insane, dis, uh, decisive charge through the mud, um, which helped him uh, in another battle, specifically of Oquan Creek. He has a whole bunch of different battles and a whole bunch of different things, and ultimately ends up basically being really a dominant figure within uh, the army of the Shenandoah, specifically. In one battle, uh, in particular, which would be the, the uh, in Cedar Creek, um, he's going to be once again hurt. He's going to be hurt about three or four times during this particular point in time, but this is probably the second most uh, brutal. He's basically leading uh, troops and men, and he's on a horse, and his horse gets shot out from under him, and basically the horse falls on his ankle and uh, sprains, or I think it might have broken his ankle, uh, specifically, excuse me, and then he was also hit in the head by, um, basically, um, a bullet that almost, that just lost its steam, and, or, apparently what, uh, one of the records says is that the bullet basically killed someone, and then passed through that person's head, and then it hit him in the head, uh, specifically, and it's just, it's just funny, because, again, it's one of these instances that, you know, a lot of his men had assumed he had been killed, it, combat in the Civil War, it's chaotic, it's crazy, just imagine what is happening during this particular point in time, now, whenever he didn't have, uh, any specific battles, or anything that was going on, Understand absentee ballots were a thing. He was actively campaigning for Abraham Lincoln vigorously uh, for the president's re-election. He's basically encouraging all his troops to basically be like, Hey, guys, you gotta f- vote for your man. Vote for your boy. Encourage, you know, the Republicans to win, you know? He understood, and he wanted his troops to understand that, you know, their commander-in-chief was basically, you know, they needed, he needed their support, uh, that they needed his support, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. you know how it goes, and ultimately Abraham Lincoln is going to be re-elected. While fighting in uh, late 1864, Rutherford B. Hayes had learned that he had been nominated for election <laughs> to Congress. And in fact, by October of that, uh, the actual election season, he finds out that he would win, <laughs> which is really fascinating. He would win the election in October, but would not serve until December of 1865. And he was basically determined to stay in the army. And he would stay in the army uh, basically until June of 1865. Cedar Creek was Hayes' last battle specifically. Uh, he had been promoted by that point to be a brigadier general. And once the war was over, he would effectively retire uh, and would be relieved of his command. Uh, he would basically be distinguished and gallant for his services, and I think he was a brevet major general uh, by that particular point in time. Hayes, you know, he was very happy to be a general, but you know, he he never fought a battle as one though, and he was just basically a citizen who wanted to help this country and help make the army a free and help really the country become a this r- really beautiful democratic republic. Uh, successfully, a one who believed within the actual constitution itself. Man, the books have really specific definitions and descriptions, and I just thought that one was really, really interesting. Now, once he retires from the army, he comes home. Obviously, he comes home for quite some time. Um, well, technically, once he's out of uh, uh, of the military, he could he's technically a congressman, the United States uh, Ohio congressional representative. And they wouldn't meet until uh, December of that year. And at this point, too, you have to understand, Abraham Lincoln's assassinated. He's deeply sad and a little bit broken, but he's also going to support Andrew Johnson. He actually liked Andrew Johnson uh, for, at least in the early goings, for the most part. I think he just wanted to believe in someone who was going to effectively continue Abraham Lincoln's policy. And by all accounts at that time, uh, he believed that Andrew Johnson was going to continue a lot of the reconstruction policies that Abraham Lincoln was going to establish. Ultimately, though, once he goes in, it's very clear that Andrew Johnson is not going to do that. Or at the very least, it's going to be a bastardization, ultimately, of what Abraham Lincoln really wanted to do. And when he's in Congress, he's a moderate. 
a moderate Republican. He's basically not one of these radical individuals who wants to punish um, the South. He had just fought a war um, against the South. He doesn't want to punish them. He's like, we're all brothers, basically. I mean, that, that's a little bit his perspective. And for the most part, I, I just think, you know, it's really unnecessary in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, like I said, he's a moderate. He's not going to push anything that's too crazy. But ultimately, once Johnson starts going down his specific path and specifically uh, doing everything he can in order to effectively just, you know, push out uh, anything that the Republican Party was, was trying to do or what, what they were effectively trying to do, he ultimately ends up siding with the radicals. And a lot of it had to do with party unity around that particular point in time, too, because basically the Democrats were just trying to peek back in, but ultimately he's just like, nah, we need, we need to get things done. So he just says, I'll, I'll just vote for whatever the radicals ultimately end up wanting to do, uh, specifically, consistently voting alongside party lines. He was voting along with uh, the measures of the Civil Rights Bill, um, which declared all born in the United States were citizens regardless of race or color, and, you know, had the rights of citizens, the Freedman's Bill, and ultimately, you know, the 14th Amendment, um, and the 15th Amendment, too, I believe, eventually, but, you know, and, and it's difficult, too, because while he's in Congress, um, he has to go, he misses his family, he had been away from them for, for quite a long time, at this point, his family is uh, up to about five or six kids by this particular point in time. He's he's a very busy man, if you know what I'm saying. And, you know, he's just doing his thing for the most part. You know, he and he's just a really good congressman for the most part. He attended faithfully. He's someone that does his duty. You know, he rarely spoke and... Unless it was something crazy, crazy, and then he would be like, okay, radicals, you need to chill. You need to vibe out for a second. Smoke some doobies, you know? And he's really just someone that just does his job. You know, he's, which I think is what, you know, ultimately, I think in a lot of ways the president should, which is which is why I have a fascinating perspective on Hayes at times, because, you know, he's just going to be someone that just does his job. That's ultimately what... Uh, you know, a lot of people see of him in Rutherford B. Hayes when he when he becomes president, but as a congressman, he's just, yeah, I'm just going to show up, do my 9 to 5, do what I'm supposed to do, and clock out. You know, and once things continued within uh, the House, he would campaign vigorously uh, for re-election uh, in 1866, uh, really just on Reconstruction, ultimately. He actually argued um that there are two plans of reconstruction one of lincoln and one that jefferson davis would like um and basically just arguing on the merits ultimately he basically at this point is just campaigning vigorously on the radical republican agenda which would actually help him uh, get his win in two things or three things actually one he wanted to be with his family more so you know him staying uh, away from his family in ohio he wanted to leave uh, office really as soon as possible and number two um despite what a lot of books would say is an average record he was still a very popular congressman and very popular figure in ohio two things of that reason being you know, he's a war hero and ultimately he's just not someone that's going to vote for aggressive things he just isn't anyone that's going to try to aggressively intervene specifically in your life um he's a very hands-off person to be quite honest with you and you know number three i think the radical republicans were going too far a lot of the radical reconstruction acts um he supported the radical republican agenda but he had uh, I guess you could say conflicting thoughts on the Tenure of Office Act, which, you know, was, was basically political entrapment in a lot of ways, but he didn't really say or do anything about it, and in fact would leave office in uh, 1867 when, coincidentally, a spot would open up. You know, and it, his house career is pretty boring, to be quite honest with you. I think the only thing he ended up really doing and being a part of was the library committee, specifically managing and adding two wings to the Library of Congress uh, and to increase appropriations to have more uh, books to actually be commissioned. That being said, uh, a spot opened up within Ohio, a governor spot. Uh, in 1867, he decided, that, and the Republicans ultimately were just like, dude, you're our, boy, you're our boy, just do it. So Rutherford B. Hayes in 1867 is going to run as the Republican nominee for the governor of Ohio. And 
he had a, a lot of fascinating perspectives. He took an unpopular stands of, you know, supporting an amendment uh, in Ohio, which would basically give uh, uh, the voting rights to the uh, to the African Americans, the Fourteenth Amendment, and you know, because you have to understand at this point, Ohio is a very fascinating place. It's still a bit of a frontier state in some parts, and Democrats still have um, some appeal there. And like I said, the country's in a very tricky place uh, at this particular point in time. You know, it's not just the South that's purely racist, because um, you know, there's a lot of freedom-minded republican people down there that aren't and don't have those specific values and it's not like the entire north was all good to be quite honest in fact there was a lot of democrats and a lot of democrats had appealed to the whole racial prejudice and hayes was aggressive and he's like you you guys are basically you know you guys are doing treasonous things we just fought a war over this anyways um uh, he also appealed to anti uh, anti uh, Catholicism apparently, which hurt the Democrats. But you know, it, it's interesting. Anyways, he goes around the country, or goes around the state, specifically in Ohio. And he's making a whole bunch of different speeches. His family's with them. His wife is pregnant with their only daughter, who they named Fanny after his sister. And he's enjoying, you know, the sights and the sounds. And it helps that a lot of the men that he led and that he fought with of, you know, the the, the 23rd Regiment, um, he just encounters along the way. He's like, hey, Billy Bob, what y'all doing there? Oh, my God, that's cool. Anyways, once the election comes around, uh, there's there's disputed reports throughout. Apparently, initially, uh, the initial reports of the Democratic Party had won. Uh, Hayes ultimately after basically a lot of recounts and a lot of you know specific stuff uh showed that you know rutherford b hayes beat his opponent this guy named alan thurman um ultimately by about three thousand votes and he would become the next governor of ohio as the governor of ohio uh ironically he would be inaugurated on a very snowy day which i think a lot of people and and one of his biographers points out he probably had some consideration, perhaps, uh, for the people in the audience. But Rutherford B. Hayes, in his inaugural address uh, as the governor, had the shortest inaugural speech in Ohio's history, apparently. And uh, he just basically was just like, I'm a platform on voting rights for all people, which is very difficult because Democrats within the state legislature had a majority. And the suffrage amendment specifically would be defeated uh, ironically in ohio despite many attempts to really push forward through it but nonetheless being the governor he really enjoyed it he didn't have a lot of power so he's basically just like i'm gonna let the people do what they're gonna do he enjoyed life in columbus and ultimately um for the most part seemed like he was going to be much more on the national stage to be quite honest with you the republican party in general really started putting him on much more of a nationalistic platform. You know, this is one of those things where you start realizing, oh, so they're they're kind of grooming him to be the next president. Okay, this is interesting. You know, he was consulted on national matters within the Republican Party uh, as a whole. Excuse me. Uh, with the leaders specifically, he was there for a lot of the big things in the national matters. Apparently, he did uh, attend Andrew Johnson's impeachment trial. And then, you know, during the National Republican national convention he is heading the ohio delegation is basically pushing for uh his you know the the union army leader ulysses s grant and he basically would be just a chill governor to be quite honest with you if i'm gonna be honest at least in the very early goings uh, before he would retire rutherford b hayes attempted to run for a second term in 1869 uh by this point Politically speaking, things were shifting. You know, people were more accepting of, you know, uh, African Americans. And I believe the 14th Amendment still wasn't specifically ratified uh, within Ohio. Um, I don't know if it was or wasn't then. Um, but the idea and the thing that was going to be on the ballot was the 15th Amendment, specifically to, of the United States uh, Constitution, which guaranteed black male suffrage, which Hayes was. You know, wholeheartedly for his opponent at this time would be George Hunt Pendleton, and basically um, Hayes is he's he's learning. He's basically like, look, it's not only um, just me being the governor. But we need a Republican majority within the state legislature, and battle lines are drawn. 
and Democrats lost on the black suffrage movement, unfortunately. Also with um, uh, greenbacks, paying them, uh, paying the debts off in greenbacks rather than gold specifically, which is kind of insane. It's basically just paying credit off with credit, um, which is unfortunate. <laughs> so, but uh, basically at that particular point in time, people were basically like, Democrats, you're, you're losing a whole bunch of, you're losing your shit. Anyways, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes would win his re-election bid, and the Republican would take the Republicans would take a majority within the Ohio State Legislature, and the Fifteenth Amendment would pass. And with him basically at the helm, and the Republicans, you know, at the the forefront of everything, he supported a whole bunch of different things, um, the creation of several colleges. Notably, I might want to add this college known as the Agricultural and uh, Mechanical College, which would later be known today as the Ohio State University. And uh, his wife, Lucy, who at this point, she's a mother of seven kids. Um, she's basically doing a whole bunch of different things. She created this this um, this orphanage home, Soldiers and Sailors Orphans, um, with her husband's endorsement and, and with the help of the state legislature to help, you know, Orphans, unfortunately, um, he did a bunch of different things. He commuted certain death sentences, death sentences, um, reformed a whole bunch of uh, uh, basically facilities, um, juvenile detention facilities, reformed schools, and he basically, at the same time, attempted to the best of his ability to try and stop basically. Um, basically being in, embedded in people's lives. He attempted to reduce state taxes, reform the whole st entire just state prison system. He's basically just saying, I'm going to let you guys do what you got to do. You know what I'm saying, fam? And, and this is beautiful for him. He got to enjoy life with his family. He got to be with his family. He got to really do the things that he wanted to do. And by this point, he's probably one of the more prominent Republicans within the Republican Party by this particular point in time. Uh, January of 1872, he's basically saying, eh, I'm done. I'm not going to seek re-election. And the Republicans are basically saying, you can run for the Senate. Do something about that. And run against uh, John Sherman, and or the incumbent Republican John Sherman, surprisingly. And he's just like, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that to, to my homeboy whatsoever. And instead, he basically is just going to retire. He's pushing for Grant to in, to win his re-election campaign in uh, 1872. And he decides, I'm going to retire. So he goes, um, uh, God, what was it? He goes home, effectively. His uncle Sardis had actually build, um, built him a home in Fremont. And now he and his family just basically were chilling. And enjoyed luxury and life. And really didn't have to worry about money. The Hayes family is really set up. So what's going to happen next? Life. Life would happen. You have to understand Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, by this particular point in time, he's roughly in his 50s. And, you know, he's just contemplating his future. He has to attend to a whole bunch of different things, to be honest with you. Family. His uh, last child uh, is going to be born around this point in time, but it's sadly the, the boy would die in, in childbirth, or childhood specifically. I think at this point, they had three boys die in childhood, and which is unfortunate and tragic. Uh, but ultimately, he's just going to retire. He's just focusing on enjoying life uh, with his family, which again, it's really difficult, but you know, we have a lot of boys die. And ultimately, just decided he wanted to just take a relaxing moment away from politics he's still a prominent politician i guess it would be um akin and this might be a bad example but like uh you know like if say governor cuomo of new york decided he's just gonna vibe out for a little bit retire and then um I'm, I'm, it's, it's, he's, he's up to that level of stature i think relatively speaking within his party he goes home uh, his, the uncle sardis unfortunately is going to die in which case a lot of of uh, his inheritance is going to be given to um, Rutherford B. Hayes. And they actually move into his home, specifically Spiegel Grove, um, which he had inherited upon his death. And he really just decides he's just going to vibe out. Really vibe out. He um, supports the Republicans despite, you know, the, the Panic of 1873. And does a whole bunch of different military reunions. And he's invited out by a whole bunch of different generals. Notably General Custard. 
um, taking tours of the Great Plains, and really actually starts dabbling in a whole bunch of different things, real estate, uh, contemplating a career again in, in the legal uh, era, but, you know, he has money, he has family, he can really just do whatever he wants. Despite, you know, having a relatively boring life now, all he would do is read, raise his kids in a, you know, I don't want to say a moderate way, <laughs> uh, but, you know, he was basically just helping them pursue education. Most of his kids, are the older ones in particular, they're, they're basically off to college uh, by this particular point in time. So for Rutherford B. Hayes, this is really an opportunity for him to really, you know, relax, unwind, figure some things out. Um, ultimately ends up just really puttering around the garden. You know what I'm saying? And really just pursuing traveling and uh specifically uh, historical and ge genealogical research specifically into you know a lot of people and specifically his genealogy and and just really interested in history ultimately reading a lot of history books too and uh despite all you know him basically i don't want to say retiring specifically from politics because he's technically not retired um he would still participate within uh, the republican um congressional party for the most part uh, at the very least campaigning for the republican congressional candidates um but unfortunately for them and this would be the for the first time since the civil war the democrats took a majority uh, of a house in congress specifically in which case things were starting to get testy in 1874 around that particular point in time and you know despite having the really relaxing life you know going out for for tea some coffee and really enjoying life going to clubs you know literacy clubs and you know doing the whole debating society thing still uh within cincinnati technically or spiegel grove Rutherford B. Hayes is given an opportunity. The Republicans are losing. They're, they're really being defeated. Um, Grant's presidency excuse me, is not going well. Scandals left and right are occurring, and things are just not looking very good. And, they're trying, and the Republicans right now coming to, by 1874, a stark realization that Ulysses S. Grant is probably, more than likely, if he does run for a third term, is going to have, you know, a contested election so they're trying to figure out certain candidates in a lot of ways to try and see who could be the successor to ulysses s grant and they have a couple different prospects specifically but uh they are hiring uh young well not young but relatively speaking um the veteran rutherford b hayes himself and they're gonna ask and i think this is both a bit of a test, and I think also something that he really wanted to do, and also just a whole bunch of different reasons. Rutherford B. Hayes, in the, I believe, off election of 1874-1875, is going to have another opportunity to run for the governorship one more time. And when he goes back to run for the governorship against uh, William Allen, things are interesting he this is mainly much more of a, of a different campaign that he launches uh, specifically more so on religion um basically protestant fears uh and basically just you know state aid to religious institutions in school and you know he, he hayes is basically like i just don't think you know we should be spending money on anything really for the most part and he would win which has never happened before. Three, someone winning the governorship three times has actually never happened before in uh, Ohio State history. But he's going to be the governor yet again for the third time uh, in the state of Ohio. For the, basically the most part, on no money in in a. Uh, in schools specifically for religious schools at the at the very least for the most part and also just sound money in general as governor yet again winning uh for the, the actual third term of the governorship rutherford b hayes continues a lot of the things that he was doing before um basically reducing taxes as much as he possibly could and also you know fixing the penal system just in general to be honest with you which was you know just Less people in jail is probably better, um, especially if it's unnecessary crimes, you know, little things like that for the most part. Um, 
And again, it's it's good for him. He gets to be with his family, back in politics, um, a decent pay, relatively speaking, for the most part. And while he's much more busy at this particular point in time, because the truth and reality is, is that this was pushing him towards the much more national political scene. Him winning a third term showed that he had some legs, he had some strength, and the Republicans really needed every single person on board, for the most part, in what will be the election of 1876. I'll get to that very briefly, but for the most part, the Republican nominating a national convention specifically um, had a couple nominees. Um, I would probably say the biggest nominees specifically were James G. Blaine of Maine, um, who had actually served um, as a House representative, a Senate member, and was the, and will be the Secretary of State, actually, of uh, two different presidents, uh, specifically um, the two um, successor presidents, uh, James Garfield, and I think William, uh, no, Benjamin Harrison, sorry, getting all my Harrisons mixed up, um, being the only other, you know, he's going to be a very prominent member and prominent figure in future presidential elections and also just in general, um, the cabinets of certain political men and certain political presidents. Um, John Sherman himself, the, uh, the senator, um, uh, God, what, what, what senator was he from again? Um, actually, the state of Ohio. Yeah, God, sorry. I'm getting the Shermans mixed up because I'm thinking William T. Sherman. John Sherman, if you don't know, is the, is the guy who is going to be the, the lead um, legislator who's going to create the, the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is named after him specifically. And he's going to be, he was one presidential hopeful and potential nominee as well. But Sherman uh, is going to actually push a lot of his baskets into Hay's basket. Ultimately, James G. Blaine is going to be the number one guy. And then there's, there's other people. Um, another guy, the uh, William A. Wheeler, is going to get an opportunity. But I think he's ultimately uh, going to be the guy who's going to be his vice president for the most part. Or at least nominated for the vice presidency. And it was a bit of a, a contested uh, national nominating committee. Blaine was the guy, but once, you know, he won Ohio, and once things started becoming contested of who the actual guy was going to be, um, they ultimately ended up choosing Hayes, and they chose Hayes for numerous reasons. One, um, they wanted a much more moderate candidate, and one who was probably leaning towards a much more conservative perspective and point of view. You know, Hayes could probably win some of that southern vote back and some of the the the, the people in particular who are um i guess apprehensive towards the radical republicans who are aggressively spending and whatnot and you know hayes is basically like oh, i'm not going to do that at all i'm just going to do my job and do what's what's going to be needed and done hayes ultimately is chosen honestly in my personal view just because he's kind of milk toast to be quite honest with you it's kind of just like and, and again, it sounds bad, and he's nothing like him. But it's kind of like if, the uh, you know, if one of the political parties sent out a guy like Joe Biden, for instance. You know, it's uh, it is what it is. Um, but ultimately, it's kind of like, like just the ultimate compromise candidate. There's nothing specifically um, outlandish or crazy about Rutherford B. Hayes. He's a safe person to nominate for the most part. But ultimately, he will get the nomination. He will beat uh, James G. Blaine, and the Republican Party will nominate Rutherford B. Hayes and uh, William A. Wheeler from New York for vice president. Which, by the way, is kind of funny, because I don't actually think he knew who Wheeler was until the, the actual uh, election came about. Let's just get into it. The election of 1876, which is going to be... Ultimately, I think the most consequential elections um, in this country's history for many reasons, and that which I will get to uh, explaining. It is basically Republicans and Democrats, and the Democrats, after failing to get a guy in as their nominee in the previous election, they get their shit together. They choose uh, a man, Samuel J. Tilden who with his running mate um thomas a Hendricks against rutherford b hayes and william a wheeler now tilden's interesting he's a used to be the governor of new york and he's a democrat and 
supported the union throughout, although he didn't really serve, um, which is, goes counter uh, to Rutherford B. Hayes. This was a highly contentious election. This is a very um, disputed <laughs> election. Hayes uh, and his supporters effectively waived what we know in um, the bloody shirt, contrasting, uh, you know, basically that I fought in the war, you didn't, ultimately, and Tilden's failure uh, to serve in the war. But, you know, the Tilden himself um, was also going to be really imp- imperative, too. He was basically running on, uh, we're going to reform everything. He had just busted uh, the uh, Sam, the the Tweed uh, political ring uh, to bolster his uh, record specifically as a political reformer. You have to understand it's like, oh, we've had all these scandals, et cetera, et cetera, and then this guy's going to actually come in and he's already done it in New York. Why can't he do it in you know other places, et cetera, et cetera, in this entire country? And, you know, the country after, you have to remember, this is about a decade after the Civil War, the country, you know, might be prepared to, you know, have another Democrat, and the Republicans clearly aren't doing anything. And the election itself is really contested. People are, excuse me, going everywhere and doing their absolute best to actually campaign for the respective candidates. Excuse me, like I said, uh, Repu- sorry, Rutherford B. Hayes, sorry, having a lot of gastric problems right now. Rutherford B. Hayes, um, despite gaining some much more positive notoriety, is still a bit of a relative unknown for the most part uh, outside of Ohio. But, you know, once he's on the national stage and people are, are, are rooting for him and, and pushing for him, uh, at least in comparison to, to Tilden, who's like, oh, you busted that, that crime thing all up, and that's great, you know. It's a very contentious election, ultimately. Um, and it's really going to be down to the wire. In fact, um, by the election day itself, um, which is contested to be, and it's really interesting because um, this will be the last election, I believe, um, in which state legislators actually choose their electors. Because um, Colorado had just been admitted uh, to the union before uh, the election itself, and uh, they ended up using state electors, uh, and they cast all three of their votes to the Republican Party. Now, when the election and everything is all cast and everything's all done, for the most part, Rutherford B. Hayes uh, believed he had lost uh, the election. He actually went to bed the next day believing that he had lost the election. After the election was held, two things were known. Tilden had won the popular vote, 50% to um, beat Rutherford's 48% uh, for the most part. It was basically the difference between um, a couple hundred thousand votes. The big problem, unfortunately, was that, and you have to look at the electoral map, it's really fascinating when you actually get to look at it. Um, three states in particular were in dispute. The electoral college, you have to understand, you have to win that if you're going to win the presidency in particular. Um, which, you know, it's, we're not a democracy, we're a constitutional republic. People have to remember that. And anyways, um, three states were in particular, uh, and all southern states, ironically, that were in contention for the most part. South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. And this is, became a bit of a problem. The Constitution did not provide specific instructions for the the course of action we should take in order to figure out who is the actual winner of this election. And, you know, crisis loom. People were kind of confused for at least a day and just trying to figure out what the hell, who's the, who's the actual winner. Since Florida in particular, or not Florida, in South Carolina in particular, uh, were... It's very clear um, that there was fraud, threats of violence against Republican voters, a lot of them African Americans, um, and just disputed numbers back and forth with them coming back with really uh, finicky insult. Like, here's the thing: if you think the election has, if there, if you don't, if you don't think that the election is fraudulent today for um, the Orange Man. Um, you know, whatever your personal political opinion is, um, because, you know, oh, it's impossible. Our elections are secure. You know, our, our elections really have never truly been secure. They can be stolen at any point. You know, it's, it happened in 1824, Tandra Jackson, and, you know, things happen, you know, 
real shady shit happens sometimes and this in, in this particular election you know in, in it's still in dispute to this day and there's two sides to every story the democrat side is for the most part they had these all locked in and it's basically just republicans maybe padding the vote and then for the for the de- for the republicans it's like well no they probably would have lost these states had they actually allowed you know the republicans to actually vote in the state and you know goes back and forth depending on your personal opinion but ultimately when people are trying to figure out and see that okay there's like 15 different results in every single state and half are for Hayes and the other half are for Tilden and no one knows which is which disputes okay when we look at the audits we look at everything and you know there's a lot of actual tickets that appear to be what would be the equivalent of printed or they at the very least seem like you know they're contested and you know real shady uh ballots i guess you could say with you know shady stuff happening ballots are very different back then you have to remember that too it's not like oh uh, you do this and fill those little things out with the bubble no it's, it's very different um and then just random what would be the equivalent of their data analysis you know 101 <laughs> percent of all eligible voters in the state had their votes counted and it's like okay what are you doing what are we doing guys basically republicans and democrats within congress and basically just decide okay we need to figure this out either your guy won or my or our guy won but we need to figure this out so they ultimately decided a bipartisan commission of 15 to settle the matter it would be five representatives uh five senators five supreme court justices um that broke down to at the time initially seven republicans and seven democrats and one independent but one but the independent uh who's the actual supreme court justice uh ultimately chose not to serve he's like eh, i'm not doing this which is kind of shitty but ultimately they ended up being replaced uh by a republican now there's some disputes obviously uh the republican ended up being the part of the guy and they just and they said our deadline is march 5th which at the time was inauguration day so they start hearings they start hearing you know the state-by-state issues that are going on um and there's a whole bunch of different issues it's very likely that at the very least a lot of the southerners in the three contested states in particular had threatened violence um to specifically the majority black populations in a lot of those states which led to the popular vote and ultimately the contested election elect, election results uh, that occurred in those states and ultimately um you know like i said a majority black population they're very brave people and strong people and ultimately it was very likely that you know a lot of the white southerners had to you know print a whole bunch of different ballots and there's a whole bunch of different contentious issues that went along with the, the governors of a lot of those states and in particular oregon who had a democratically elected governor um democrat governor and con- just basically just contested uh, the legality of uh, the the GOP elector themselves um, to a point where you know even the Democrats were kind of just like okay what are you doing dude come on ultimately the commission in those three contested states or four technically uh, including Oregon Oregon was Republican um, they all agreed and voted party lines for the most part eight to seven eight to seven eight to seven that all the votes go to Rutherford B Hayes that's generally how it went down for the most part and democrats got mad obviously they they probably would and they basically threatened to just gridlock everything for the most part so what ultimately occurred from this because of the gridlock because of what was going to happen ultimately was the compromise of 1877 the compromise of 1877 it's this unwritten deal it's, there's no paperwork for it it's informally arranged by most of the of, of the house and and the senate for the most part just congress in general to just to basically finish the disputed election of 1876 the democrats would basically give up and allow the decision of the electoral college to to, to play out if the following things had actually occurred first and foremost remove all remaining u.s military forces from the former confederate states which at that time included south carolina and florida 
Um, which, the, and I'm talking about the complete withdrawal from the region. Uh, number two, the rights to deal with African Americans in the South without, you know, northern interference, and you know, basically just rebuilding the South, like the Southern economy, functionally, and industrializing them, building a transcontinental railroad, et cetera, et cetera. Tilden is not happy with it, but he's also kind of just okay, cool. I may have been cheated, but you know what? I can actually retire now. And Hayes and his supporters are all happy because he's the president, although a lot of people are not happy with this decision. In fact, I think the New York uh, Sun ran a headline, Mr. Hayes is not my president, in which they were continue to basically keep pushing that narrative um, for the next couple of years. And a lot of people were not happy that Rutherford B. Hayes was president. Now, first and foremost, did he technically win? Um, that's still up to debate. It, it, Cause you have to understand, this happened on both sides. Okay, there's a lot of people, um, you know, the intimidation of black voters in the South, as well as accusations of possible bribery of electors and other different individuals and people, um, really lead to the legitimacy of Hayes's presidency, and. You know, it. This is really fascinating. First and foremost, Hayes is going to make this make the the pledge that he's only going to run one term too. Which I want to point that out. I forgot to to bring that up. He's going to be a one term president uh, by choice. Um, at least I, I at least you know most books would probably say that. Now, did he win though? You know, it's still up. To, it's will still be up for the debate. We're still f- trying to figure things out. Hundreds of years later, or a hundred years plus years later, and we don't know. It's always going to be a bit of a mystery and a bit of a fascinating mystery, uh, really, at that. But the truth is, is that this is much more catastrophic for a lot of reasons. First and foremost, it really put the legitimacy of a lot of our elections really in doubt um, in a contentious period of time where, you know, we're still trying to find unity. And, you know, it's very clear that a decade after the Civil War, we are still as divided as we've ever been, uh, specifically on these just political bases for the most part. Number two, the Compromise of 1877. Unfortunately, and look, here's the truth. You know, I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat. I don't have any political affiliation. I'm just someone that is fascinated by, excuse me, um, the dynamics of history and politics, to be quite honest with you. Republicans will always say Abraham Lincoln, you know, they are the party of Abraham Lincoln, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, it's been uh, 10 years later, the, the party of Abraham Lincoln is no longer the party of Abraham Lincoln. You know, it's the party of Hayes and ultimately the party that would basically give up on the black people in the South. You know, the Compromise of 1877, when troops are forced to leave um, the South, unfortunately, leads to effectively what will become, you know, for the next hundred years, um, Jim Crow laws and all these problems that will occur that will lead to the Civil Rights Movement a hundred years later. You know, and because there's always going to be this narrative on both sides. If you're Republican, you're basically saying that, you know, nah, these Democrats in these cities are just not helping the black people, yada, yada. And they're basically just do, do, do nothing for the most part. And all welfare, yada, yada. But the unfortunate reality and truth is, is that, you know, Republicans are not helping them either. And they did not help them in 1876 and 1877 when they left them behind. And, you know, it, it's tough. This ultimately is one of the, the most consequential decisions that the Republicans have ever done and ever made, uh, to be quite honest with you. And then it really just goes into much more of a philosophical question. Did, did, did they, could they do anything about it, to be quite honest with you? I don't know. It's tough. Which is why I say history just tends to work the way it does, to be quite honest with you. Which is why I'm not someone that's, you know, I, I don't play in what ifs. Because if you really look at this... What could they have done? Could things have been different? I mean, the only thing that would have stopped this from happening is if Hayes had won decisively. But there's contention on both sides, and ultimately, everything was going to probably turn out this way in some way, shape, and form, uh, ultimately. 
And if anything, this probably stopped a second civil war um, from potentially happening. So it depends on your perspective. It depends on how you look at things. Because like I said, this country is not fully healed from the civil war. And it's very clear that we're just as divided as we've ever been. Things can happen. And, you know, ultimately, this decision, the the compromise of 1877, would lead... um, just negative consequences for African Americans in the South. Rather, Rufford B. Hayes, I think, understood this, and I think it's a bit melancholy for him to become president. But Rutherford B. Hayes, technically speaking, will win the election of 1876 and will become the 19th president of the United States of America. Rutherford B. Hayes will be inaugurated on March 3rd, I believe, a Saturday, in the Red Room of the White House. Understand that the filibuster that the Democrats had held in order to effectively, you know, contest the election would end literally the day before, um, on March 2nd, uh, which I think is is really, really funny, to be quite honest with you. Um, But ultimately, Rutherford B. Hayes will be inaugurated as the 19th president, so let's first talk about his cabinet. And with this, I just want to talk about a brief discussion of the Republican Party. Because you have to understand, once Ulysses S. Grant effectively leaves, um, there's really no specific leader within the Republican Party, to be quite honest with you. In fact, they've been fighting, uh, to be quite honest with you, for relative control of I mean, of the, of the GOP, I guess you could say. I don't want to say the establishment. That's not the right way to explain it. But, you know, parties fight, parties bicker. <clears throat> and the direction of what the Republican Party was going to be um, really begins here. Because, you know, the previous decade they had two men, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant, who were the main men who were going to be leading uh, the, the party. And once those two left, you know, there's new faces. The next decade of, you know, politicians are going to be coming up. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of different people that are going to really start rising up eventually. A lot of these guys being post-Civil War men who are rising through the ranks, politically speaking. One of these guys being Rutherford B. Hayes, obviously. But there's really no one uh, specifically. The Democrats still have a couple more stronger guys specifically i mean tilden you could argue would have won um not it, it's a complicated argument like i said before with the election of 1877 but still the whole point being that you know there's no identity they're kind of like a party without really any really any strong candidates and the truth is, is that you know b hayes really was their guy there really was no one else's this, this compromised cab uh, candidate that they were going to throw out for the most part and Hayes, Hayes' cabinet is very reflective in a lot of ways of um, this disjointed nature of what the party ultimately is at this particular point in time. I mean, a lot of his uh, choices, notably, uh, first and foremost, his secretary of state is William Maxwell Everett. He's most well known for being the specific lawyer, I think, that actually defended uh, Andrew Johnson during his impeachment trial. And... Then you have other men, most notably, you know, John Sherman, obviously, uh, who's going to be, you know, the guy who's going to the, the whole Sherman antitrust as a, the Secretary of the Treasury. And then a whole bunch of different people, um, notably George Washington McRae, who's going to actually be the guy who is going to come up with the election or Electoral Commission of 1877 to try and revamp the whole Electoral College and the whole electoral system. And several other people. I would like to point out David McKendry. He is the one Democratic individual that specifically will be a part of his cabinet for the better part of a couple of years. As the one of the, the pieces, uh, specifically, also, that goes along with the Compromise of 1877. Excuse me. That he was going to have a Democratic representation on his cabinet. But this entire, this entire cabinet is fascinating. It's a mixture of what a lot of people would call um, stalwarts and, um, God, what was it? Sorry, my, my brain is not working. Stalwarts and half-breeds, which I think are really fascinating terms. Um, they're basically, and I think both of them you could argue are moderate I guess you could say moderate Republicans in a lot of ways. Half-breeds specifically are the, and I guess you could say aggressively so, um, the moderates of the party, specifically moderates to conservatives of the Republican Party that specifically are, you know, old school uh, styled kind of, you know, 
like we need to get things back on track specifically there i think what in a lot of ways uh the republican party would in a lot of ways kind of be you know men who were like gold standard yada yada you know we should probably actually do things and not do the whole spoil systems and then stalwarts were much more i wouldn't want to say liberal I would say a little bit radical uh, in a lot of ways, and I think we're, you know, like, like let's just break down the foundations of what this country ultimately is, yada, yada, yada. You know, like, a lot of these guys, I think the creation of the Star Wars ultimately was because of uh, Ulysses S. Grant. They wanted to push him for a third term, and he's like, nah, fam, I ain't doing that. So, you know, ultimately, um, the Republican Party, like I said, it's, it's a little bit of a hectic state at this particular point in time. There's no one really leading it. There's no one really in charge of it um, functionally and fundamentally. You know, they have some leaders, but, you know, ultimately, in a lot of ways, you can argue it's a bit of a, like, a battle for the soul of what the Republican Party is ultimately going to be. Um, and ultimately, I think the half-breeds ultimately win, technically, both historically speaking and then just in general of what the Republican Party ultimately you eventually becomes is, you know, much more nationalistic, much more, you know, we need to keep this thing together in a lot of ways. And his cabinet is a bit of a reflection of that. It's also notable, too, that I, I probably won't get to as much, but I'll just say it now. Um, you know, the White House is very dry, so that didn't help a lot of his, uh, his cabinet members. And then... Uh, uh, a couple other individuals um that the white house is very dry he and his wife were known for having you know alcohol free white house gatherings giving his wife the nickname lemonade lucy in fact um the first reception at the the white house included wine um specifically <laughs> but people started getting drunk and hayes from basically was like no from that point on uh, no one's going to get drunk they will not be served alcohol for the rest of the entire Hayes presidency which is funny because then it became politics so there wasn't any alcohol in the house and you know how it goes it's, it's fucking politics I hate it but you know it's like hey you're not spending money on, on alcohol you're probably spending on other things he's like no I'm just not like come on guys come on Hayes will have three attempts at uh, placing uh, Supreme Court justices uh, throughout the entirety of his presidency. He's only going to be able to fill two, though, but let me get to it right now. When he first gets into office, uh, a Supreme Court vacancy opens up. David Davis, unfortunately, is forced to resign due to a controversy that had occurred the year before. Ultimately, Hayes is going to get the opportunity, and he ends up... Uh, basically appointing this guy john marshall holleran um very close ally of a whole bunch of different people in the republican party and ultimately a lot of people didn't like it uh, unfortunately uh the nomination or basically caused some controversy because it's like it's kind of like with um um God, i don't want to say lagoa but it's one of the the supreme rushing allison jo or jones rushing where it's like you're kind of like this radical individual in a, in a lot of ways that Trump had an opportunity to nominate for the Supreme Court. But, you know, you're only really in the office for the better part of a couple of years. So uh, the whole point I'm trying to get get at is um, there's a lack of experience uh, specifically with Halloran. But ultimately, he's going to get the nomination and end up spending the next 35 years on the Supreme Court itself and really along with a couple of the of the other nominations that um, Rutherford B. Hayes is going to uh, appoint or attempt to appoint, will always continue to fight for civil rights. The next, ultimately, is going to be uh, the ne the resi after the resignation of Justice uh, William Strong, Hayes nominates uh, William Burnham Wood, uh, Woods. And uh, William Burnham Woods. And uh, it's going to be a bit of a, of a controversial and complicated nomination. Ultimately, um, he, first and foremost, he's a Republican from Alabama, so I think that's just uh, a fascinating perspective, and uh, wanted to really appoint him to a justice spot, and a lot of people were basically like, okay, cool, so this one went pretty seamlessly, and, and Hayes ultimately ended up regretting it, other than a couple of civil rights um, cases specifically, um, uh, Woods ultimately just ended up uh, legislating, or not legislating, uh, ruling specifically much more of, of a Southern Democrat than anything else. Um, his third and final attempt will be somewhat successful, but unsuccessful technically. 
is going to be with uh, uh, Justice Noah uh, Haynes Sway, and he had resigned. And basically, he was, it was one of those situations where it's like, I'll resign if you appoint this person, kind of like with um, uh, with Kavanaugh. Uh, this or uh, two years ago, and it's, it's it's in a similar vein, and it was contested just like Kavanaugh, <laughs> surprisingly, and ultimately he would try to re- be replaced with Stanley Matthews. The problem was with Stanley Matthews, though. Ultimately, that Democrats used was that he had a lot of p- potential political connections with a lot of the you know, the railroad tycoons, the rich people, et cetera, et cetera. Notably, uh, Jay Gould. <laughs> That's not very good. And ultimately. Um, this nomination popped up near the end of his term, and he never really got the opportunity to, to to really fill it. The Senate had basically just said, "We'll just wait until you know the election until to to basically have an opportunity to fill the Supreme Court spot." Which, you know, to the Democrat surprise, James A. Garfield's going to win, and he will then appoint Stanley Matthews into the actual Supreme Court spot. What are the events that occurred during Rutherford B. Hayes's presidency? What what are the things that occur uh you know before after the lead up what is the country like um during the time rutherford b hayes becomes president well first and foremost it's going to be a fascinating time in fact you know once the federal troops leave the south uh, a series of cascading effects in a lot of ways really start to occur first and foremost once the the troops leave um a lot of things occur like i said and the first being that the South solidifies in a lot of ways their strength, their power, and their capabilities. They really get that stranglehold ultimately uh, with following midterm elections and the uh, 1878 midterm elections in particular, where the House uh, really just stays Democrat for, for quite some time ultimately and really makes the country have to work together specifically, which is a very crucial time. We have to understand that. You know, for a lot of times in this country's history, you know, both houses of Congress have always been really one party, and it always tended to be uh, the People's Party, the, the Democratic Party at this point, or, you know, the not the, not the Whigs or the Federalists or anything like that. And, you know, this is in, at the, after all the tensions of the Civil War. It's around this time when things really start becoming even, and it's really about we're going to win not through blood and violence like before like our forefathers but we're gonna win through politics and we're gonna basically do what we can ultimately to achieve this level of capability and stature (sighs) ultimately what i will say is that what will be known effectively for the next arguably hundred years is gonna be created now and that's the solid south Meaning that it's basically, for the most part, um, all those southern states in particular, a lot of the states that, uh, for the most part, really um, uh, were, you know, housed by federal troops, uh, ultimately end up being the solid south. Ultimately, the states that will vote specifically for the Democratic Party and the Democratic Jacksonian Party, in a lot of ways, um, continuing uh, that tradition for the next hundred years, specifically won't be really until, you know, in in some ways, Barry Goldwater and uh, Richard Nixon that the Solid South ultimately ends up breaking uh, towards uh, the Republican Party. You know, and and because the troops are leaving in the South, they can actually focus on other aspects within the country's history, or basically within the country. Notably, um, some interventions with some civil, I guess you could say, unions in some ways, but in, in small scale stuff that will occur over the next, um, you know, decade or, or a couple decades or so, um, in which federal troops will actually have to come in and stop union riots and whatnot that will occur. But because they can also focus on other aspects of not only the country but the world, the United States focuses their attention to the West, notably the Indians and notably Custard's Last Stand, you know, and a whole slew of different things that will effectively occur, atrocities and all. And they also focus their attentions to a whole bunch of different countries, Mexico in particular, and the beginnings of, you know, capitalism in like the second or third wave of the industrial revolution market revolution transportation continues to a point where you know this country is changing you know people are richer than ever the economic problems that had occurred um during ulysses s grant's presidency are largely gone to an extent 
um, more people are working than ever, even though they are all working at you know terrible wages and terrible conditions, which is going to be one of the principal realities of the Gilded Age of America. You know the the idea ultimately of uh, you know this country. Uh, you know you, you you can work your way up to it. It was not a very r- real reality for a lot of people. In which case, things were very difficult. There's no labor laws that are going to help support you. And, you know, most people would end up working six, seven days a week, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, ultimately just to function and survive. Kids would have to work because, you know, not necessarily that they wanted their kids to work, but ultimately some kids had to work because, you know, they could get paid and it's another source of income that'll help you, you know. And a lot of a lot of people rioted. A lot of people would fight back. And a lot of people ultimately created what will become you know this progressive movement um that that will start occurring around this particular point in time but i will say this that during hayes's presidency there is at least an attempt at some semblance of peace some semblance of unity and some semblance an attempt at you know the, the absolute worst case scenario did not occur in rutherford b hayes presidency is ultimately the, the whole point I'm trying to get. This is just continuing what is really occurring with Grant's presidency. This country is going in the direction of money, finance, capitalism, and things that are going to effectively be the building blocks for us to be a real superpower and a real, you know, fire barn burner, you know, real individuals that will affect real change. And also the discrepancy where men like Karl Marx and their works are going to start really popping up. You know, which is funny because, you know, 30, 40 years from now, the United States will actually have its first genuine social uh, socialist candidate or communist candidate, I guess you could say. I think Eugene Debs. And, you know, I just want to make a very point that it's it's things like this, the this this part of the Gilded Age, the, the, the incredible industrial movement and, you know, aggressive push that this country was basically moving towards leads to movements like this and leads to movement, movements along those lines of like that Marxist doctrine, etc., etc. And it really begins, you know, really here, to be honest with you. As the world changes, um, what are some of the things that actually occur during Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency? A lot of things happen. You have to understand the world is changing. Technology and electricity are advancing, and the world is really industrializing as a whole in a way much faster than I think we tend to realize. You know, this is the era when Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla Tesla are going to be really progressing uh this level of technological advancement that's gonna I mean, more in the last like 50 years and we had had in the previous you know several hundred to be honest with you but you know a lot of things do happen first and foremost when you know hayes becomes president <coughs> Uh, Leo Tolstoy, he publishes one of his most famous novels and one of the most famous books, um, Anna Karenina. Most most of you hopefully will know that. Uh, Anna Sewell also publishes Black Beauty. Uh, again, I, I like a lot of these books. They get published around this particular point in time. Emile Berliner, he will invent the microphone. Because at this point, electricity um, is slowly becoming a thing. Um, I believe the, the telephone was becoming a thing, too. Um... German physicist Wilhelm Pfeiffer discovers the process of osmosis, which is, you know, the, the condensation. Yeah, or not. Sorry, I'm getting things all mixed up. Um, I forgot what osmosis was, to be honest with you, off the top of my head. That's uh, not good. Uh, um, and then Queen Victoria is going to be the queen of India uh, around this particular point in time. This will be known as the Satsuma Rebel Rebellion. Um, basically, samurai re- re- warriors rebelling against the the emperor in a lot of ways. You know, it's basically the last samurai. At least the the story that's it's based off of is based off of this revolution. This is also the time of many Native American battles against uh, I don't want to say Union soldiers, but American troops, uh, notably uh, against the Sioux leader Crazy Horse. He will surrender around this particular point in time in a. Uh, Fort Robinson, Nebraska. Um, Russia. A lot of wars occur around this time, too. Russia declares war on the Ottoman Empire. 
This is also the time, too, when the very first Wimbledon Tennis Championship occurs very early in Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency. And also, you know, depending on your opinion of the media, the Washington Post begins publishing in the very early goings of, U- of Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency. Thomas Edison will be doing a bunch of different things. First and foremost, he's going to uh, demonstrate his new invention, the phono- the phonograph, very early on while also starting um, the Edison Electric Company, um, very early on in Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency. <coughs> Maximilian Berlitz, he opens the school for languages in Providence, Rhode Island, while Henry Stanley publishes his two-volume work, Through the Dark Continent, detailing his travels in Africa. Louis Tiffany, the son of the jeweler, begins creating his own type of glass, which I think is kind of interesting, um, and also uh, the Gilbert and Sullivan's opera, HMS Pinafore, pr- premieres in London. In uh, 1878, Greece will also declare war on Turkey, which just a little little thing. This is also the time, at least in America, when what would be known as the Exodus of 1879, where you know roughly uh, several thousand uh, African Americans flee um, the South, basically because of obvious oppression, violence, um, and flee to Kansas. Um, and various other states to to just get away from the the, the increased levels of, of of oppression. William Burrell, he's a British physician, actually uh, discovers nitroglycerin is effective for cardiac problems. Interesting. <clears throat> Mary Baker Eddy founds the Church of Christ. Science uh, scientist Henry James publishes Daisy Miller. Um, the Zulu Wars begin uh, with Great Britain uh, against in, uh, in South Africa, where one of the famous battles that occurs a couple weeks after it starts is the Battle of Works Drift, where 140 British troops fight off thousands of Zulu warriors, warriors for several hours. The first cash register is going to be uh, invented. It's going to be uh, installed, I believe, in Dayton, Ohio, uh, in a bar. Uh, War of the Pacific begins, too, between uh, the forces of Chile, uh, actually, th- who joined forces with Chile and Peru and Bolivia against their, their enemies, I believe. Uh, it's a little bit complicated when I wrote my notes down, so I do apologize. New Haven, Connecticut will host the world's first commercial telephone. Also, the first artificial ice rink is going to open up in America. Where? Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Chemists at John Hopkins University discovered the artificial sweetener saccharin. Belva Lockwood becomes the first female lawyer to present a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. Hey, progressivism, homie. Germany and Austria Hungary form the dual alliance against Russia. Uh, Frank Woolsworth opens his first successful 5 and 10 cent store in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the Pirates of Penzance premieres in London. I should also point out 1879, very late 1879, Thomas Alva Edison will invent and demonstrate his newest invention, the light bulb. Former Civil War general and current New Mexico territorial governor in 1880, Lou Wallace, writes Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, which if you don't know Ben-Hur, it's been made a hundred times, I feel like, in movies. Um, they just had the most recent adaptation, I think, in like 2015, 2016, which was pretty crappy, but still. Wabash, Indiana, I think people should know this, becomes the first town to be lit by electricity. Martha Distel opens his famous cooking school in Paris, Le Cordon Bleu. Also, uh, Thomas Edison's gonna. Thomas Edison's doing a whole bunch of different things, uh, demonstrating his electric railway at Manila Park. And, and I feel bad. I don't. I don't think I wrote anything about Tesla, unfortunately. But he's gonna have his importance as well too during this particular point in time. Little tidbits too. Like this is going to be the first time that the uh, O Canada becomes the Canadian national anthem. Yeah, France is also gonna annex Tahiti, but that's just a little side thing. And the last thing. The last couple things I will say is the first woman 
license to practice medicine in Canada will happen at the very tail end of Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency. And also, the Cologne Cathedral will be finally completed, which, if you don't know, had actually had a very long building process. A 600-year building process that started its construction, I believe, in you know 1250. So what are the big things, first and foremost, that will actually occur during the presidency? We'll go through a lot of the big things first, um, and then we'll go through a, a general rough timeline of the of how the events transpired throughout his uh, presidency with you know some, some relative going back and forth. But for the most part, let's cover the big things. First and foremost, remember the election of 1876, the unspoken... Um, or the Compromise of 1877, technically, uh, the compromise that they ultimately came to, uh, Hayes would get the presidency, and uh, troops, federal troops in particular, would be pulled from the South. And, come to, and yet, a lot of things are going to transpire, ultimately. Uh, when Hayes gets elected, and basically is finally confirmed as the president uh, a couple days before his own presidency, and he's scrambling to get his cabinet already, um... Like I said, the country and the and just the Republican Party in general, it's a little chaotic. Um, like I said, most people, um, there was a bit of a divide within the Republican Party and his own cabinet of what to actually do. Um, a lot of people were really mad within the Republican Party um, that certain people didn't get specific um, treatment, J namely James G. Blaine, who's, I guess you could say, the, the, the specific leader of the liberal uh, wing of the Republican Party, or the the big reformer one, versus Hayes, who's a moderate, probably a little more conservative than anything else, and um, you know the, a lot of the things that Hayes would do with the end of Reconstruction, a lot of the Republicans got mad because it went against a lot of the things that he fundamentally uh, believed that it will that you know he believed for the most part. So within a month, Hayes will effectively end Reconstruction. And in fairness, you have to understand, um, for the most part, uh, Reconstruction had ended in a majority of the states. Um, a lot of the troops um, had already left and or were being funneled out of a lot of the contested states in particular, um, you know, like Texas and all of them, to, to go out west to face the Indians and a lot of the battles that would, would really occur there. You know, Congress would, would struggle for quite some time and have a lot of battles back and forth, uh, ultimately on deciding how big the military and army actually should be, um, ultimately deciding on 25,000 troops. So they didn't really have a lot of people to allocate in the Reconstruction you know, places for the most part. And the only troops that they really had um, were in specifically, I guess you could say, hot-bedded areas, specifically were you know, the, the rising... Um, red shirts or the rising, you know, Ku Klux Klan basically were still there um, in, you know, just terrorizing people, or at the very least, su uh, superseding a lot of the people's rights, notably uh, Louisiana and South Carolina specifically, uh, and mostly in like the big urban centers, the big areas with, you know, the, the, the capitals, you know, like in New York, like the New Orleans and Columbia. And a lot of these places are being protected by small band troops for the most part. So it's not like, oh my god, you know, they left them to, to, to rot and stuff. Ultimately, they, they left them a long time ago, the Republicans um, and the federal government. Ultimately, they, they left a long time ago, and Hayes was just basically finishing the job in fairness. But ultimately, they basically, the, the federal government, Hayes, said that they would leave uh, and rescind all the federal troops if the South basically just you know decided hey we'll we'll leave if you guys promise to <laughs> um allow you know voting rights etc etc and civil right reform in for everybody and the south's like sure we'll do that and yeah once they said that they would the troops would leave and ultimately a lot of problems will occur. There's going to be a lot of issues, notably in the midterm elections that I'll explain in a little bit, where the, the Deep South really gets a, a bit of a stranglehold on the actual party itself and really, really aggressively starts pushing you know, their agenda, which I guess you could say 
disenfranchises a lot of people within the South. I mean, there's going to be battles about appropriation bills, et cetera, et cetera, that will disenfranchise black people. The haze is just going to keep pushing down and pushing away. And ultimately, it's just going to be terrible. Um, black people in the South, minorities in general in the South, will suffer. A lot of them leaving for, uh, over the course of three years, notably in 1879, where it's just such a large portion of them uh, escaping the Deep South. The biggest thing that Rutherford B. Hayes is going to be uh, really known for, that it always talks about, is his attempts at uh, civil service reform. And I will say this, um, Hayes is, in my opinion, a bit of a milk toast fence-sitter kind of uh, individual, and someone that really just doesn't want to play that whole political game he's just going to do his job he's going to be bipartisan as much as he humanly can he's not going to be radical he's not going to be anyone that's going to be crazy and the one thing that he does attempt to do genuinely is civil service reform <clears throat> and he does it in a, in a really fascinating way so just let me briefly explain you know all the problems before because you have to understand this country at the very least has a lot of issues um when he came into the the presidency, you know, the national debt was uh, increased by about f you know forty times since the act since the Civil War itself, and inflation and the money was really excuse me finances were the, just the economy was struggling. There's a whole bunch of different things that Hayes is going to have to deal with, and I'll get to the money policy in a little bit. But for Hayes, a lot of that had to do with. Um, the ineffect the ineff the inefficiencies in an ineffectual federal government ultimately that was incredibly corrupt both republicans especially and absolutely democrats in which they effectively held a lot of power cuz you have to understand uh, after abraham lincoln uh, was assassinated and after the impeachment of andrew johnson uh, the executive branch was grossly weakened in a lot of meaningful ways um at this particular point in time, you have to understand, you know, the power of the president really depended on the man who was actually going to, to be the individual to, to lead the country, for the most part. You know, Andrew Jackson basically was badass. Um, you know, Polk was Polk, and um, uh, Abraham Lincoln ultimately did what he did. But ultimately, uh, the people who really ran the government to at this particular point was, you know, Congress both houses the senate and the house and they had a lot of power and to a point where you know i would say half and half uh, relatively speaking but you know a lot of appointments that a president would make were grossly influenced by the political parties themselves so you know for every single person for like the two or three uh, like supreme court justices that a president will appoint maybe one or two of them is probably just because the republicans wanted this person in for you know political and specific reasons i mean it's no different than it is today um but i'm just saying they had a lot more say back then than say you know trump today where he's just like you know it's really in a lot of ways his decision although i think although i think barrett ultimately the, the more recent Supreme Court justice really wasn't his choice in particular. It was more just like a grossly influenced uh, push for her specifically. Anyways, there was a lot of problems. And, and notably in New York, which is the most notable aspect of civil service reform that actually occurred, would be uh, with Senator Roscoe Conkling of uh, New York. He basically, along with uh, one of his guys... Notably, Chester A. Arthur, who's going to be the 21st president of the United States of America, was the collector of the Port of New York and ran the New York uh, Customs House, which basically collected the large lion's share and majority of uh, the, the country's overall revenue. And, you know, that was more for political reasons, his appointment, rather than, you know, merit-based reasons. And the first step, ultimately, in which Hayes was going to start doing this was really use the power of the president use the power of the executive branch and really Hayes wanted arthur removed not even specifically for political reasons so that's really debatable um i mean chester A. arthur within two years is going to be a vice presidential candidate so i don't think it's specifically for you know any specific biased reason but ultimately conkling had a lot of power specifically as a new york senator and ultimately vetoed hayes's 
basically order to try and remove Chester A. Arthur. And, you know, a lot of people are basically, this is a bit of a battle of politics. Politics, am I right? And this is going to go on with what's going to occur with the Democrats and, and soon after, too. But ultimately, in this particular case, Hayes wanted his own guy in there. Someone that actually, at the very least, had um, appeared to be someone of, of someone of strong character. Uh, and that was going to be unbiased and going to do the thing that he was going to do, you know, in, a, in an honest way. Notably, that first person would be Teddy Roosevelt Sr. Yes, big... TD's father himself, uh, but he would die, and I'll get to that when I when I get to Teddy Roosevelt Jr. Um, Conkling basically just got all the senators, all the legislators, and basically said, "Hey, yada yada, yada we're gonna we're gonna stop this." Especially the Republicans, the Democrats were indifferent really at this point, but they'll have their their, their turn soon, and um, they blocked it. Ultimately, Teddy Roosevelt Sr. would die too, but. Uh, Hayes just said, okay, if you want to play that game, we'll play that game. So they bided some time, and when Congress wasn't in session, Hayes just got rid of Arthur and replaced him with his own guy, Edwin uh, A. Merritt, and named Silas W. Burt, um, who himself was someone that was basically just like, that's really, we got to really fix this country, <laughs> excuse me, as a second in command at the Customs House. And when the Congress came back, everyone on the Republican Party was pissed. Um, because at the very least, Hayes was attempting to do genuine civil service reform, and the Republicans Republicans didn't like it because you know it, it, it fucked them over as a party and as a unit and as a as a just political machine. And they started trying to attack and really you know push legislation, and that was going to basically just you know make Hayes, you know, a whole bunch of different bills that were basically just like, you can't do this, you can't do that. And Hayes did what a lot of smart presidents should do. You know, say what you will about Barack Obama, but for the most part, he went to the court of public opinion, and he went to the media, and he was just like, hey guys, they're trying to make things corrupt still, so you should probably stop it. And, you know, it turned out some of the more okay Republicans and a lot of the Democrats who were basically like, hey, we're cool with this. The Republican Party is being split in half, so, you know, why as well just, just push for this and stuff. So, ultimately, he's going to end up getting uh, his guy in place as it became very clear that trying to remove him ultimately was just not going to be a good thing. That being said, it also should be pointed out that... Um, with you know Hayes getting his uh, uh, constitutional power for his appointments, um, Hayes himself is also going to have to deal with the Democrats and the Democrats in particular uh, after the eight, uh, midterm elections of 1878, when Democrats won both control won control of both houses of Congress, and they basically had could do whatever they wanted to do for the most part. And notably, a lot most of them being from the Deep South specifically, and they wanted to move. Uh, they wanted to force these unwanted laws uh, on Hayes by attaching legislation. These things were called uh, riders to, to specific money bills. And you have to understand, you know, the law, a lot of these enforcement acts to, that were there to protect uh, uh, polls and voters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, during the whole civil rights uh, laws that were, had it been instituted by a decade earlier uh, were still there. And Democrats wanted to use the riders specifically uh, in order to basically remove a lot of those restrictions for the most part. So it would be like, hey, I'm going to attach you know, specific money bills, etc., etc. Oh, I'm going to have the little fine print saying that. Oh, yeah, and then you know, because of this, you know, can't really have a, a couple of people actually you know, standing guard while you know, black people are putting their votes in. And hey, he sees this, and he's just like, no, man, you're not doing that. You're not going to intimidate people. And a lot of these writers also had the power to, to, to basically ruin what would be known as you know the president's veto. It's like, you can't veto this, Mr. President. He sounded the dotted line. And ultimately, just a battle of back and forth for basically the tail end of his presidency really occurred between um, the Democratic Congress and just Rutherford B. Hayes. And he got really mad. And he started basically just going straight forward with, you know, Hey, you do this, I'm gonna fucking just ruin you, fam. 
and ultimately just vetoed a whole bunch of different things and just kept vetoing it and again using the power of public opinion really just kept hammering it to people hey a lot of this shit's unconstitutional and you should really talk to your democratic governors or democratic legislators and democratic representatives state legislatures etc etc and people started getting very very mad by by the time um the last veto came in democrats didn't have enough strength to muster a two-thirds majority to override a whole bunch of different vetoes uh and ultimately improved in a lot of ways the standing of the republican party because of this uh, despite all the, the issues of the republican party being split apart the democrats ultimately just showed their true face and really this was a big reason why the republicans despite failing in the election of 1876 would have a much much stronger showing in the election of 1880 which i'll get to when i get to uh um, james a garfield Next, we should talk about Rutherford B. Hayes' Native American policy. Grant, effectively, was a very fascinating individual when it came to Native American policy. And here's the thing. A lot of people will probably say that he's was a, you know, advocated, I guess you could say, genocide for, you know, racist reasons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I came to the conclusion, personally, that he was very hands-off about that. Now I'm not trying to because I'm not trying to, to justify anything for Grant because he let it happen. Um, where basically the, the army and military basically left left the South and focused and really appropriating land specifically, uh, you know, for the white people and breaking a whole bunch of different promises and contracts that they had signed, you know, several years before. But for the most part, Grant basically was just doing effectively what Congress and you know the white man uh ultimately wanted um personally i'm a different you know things happen and that's just how unfortunately reality goes and it's horrible uh but at the same time you know we wouldn't be having and be where we're at today because of that and you know if you don't like it you don't like it so so be it you know i, I i'm i'm i am very unopinionated to be honest with when it comes to a lot of that stuff but it is tragic still what what happens to the native american populations hayes is a little bit different um hayes is uh, much more i think it's because for the most part with the south not being the biggest source of problems um hayes is really going to be able to fo focus so much more on uh, the native americans and specifically just, just the uh, a treatment of native americans he always believed in assimilation, specifically, um, for better and, and worse. You know, it's not like he didn't like natives. It was more so, I'd rather have you guys a part of the part of the United States than not be a part of the United States. But in doing so, you know, you're gonna have to, you know, leave your, you know, take away all your languages, your culture, everything that makes you, you know, a Native American. And you know, obviously, there's gonna people are going to have a lot of problems with that. So I don't blame them uh, in any meaningful, but I don't, I don't blame them. So ultimately, uh, Hayes is going to start by first and foremost, by appropriating a lot of money, some millions of dollars to support Native Americans who've been forced into uh, reservations in particular. This is when a lot of reservations are gonna, really going to start popping up. And, you know, Hayes just wanted what he considered a clean government. So, his Secretary of the Interior, Carl Schurz, uh, sought limited reforms within the Indian Bureau, which was this agency uh, that administered policies that affected, you know, Native Americans. And he tried to clean things out and make things, you know, really good in the treatment of Native Americans as good as possible. The problem is, is that uh, when he came in, and this is going to be very early uh, for the most part within... Uh, his presidency a lot of the policies that grant had instilled uh were still uh, effectively happening notably um one native group the nez Perce, from their ancestral lands in eastern oregon and of the ponca from the reserve along the uh um, dakota territory led to basically just war um you know they would fight a war over 17 mile territory uh, before they were forced to retreat and surrender in Montana. They were actually almost there to the Canadian border themselves, but ultimately the, the natives would lose in a lot of these battles. And um, the Poncas in particular was very brutal. I think I briefly talked about it earlier in the things that would actually occur. 
um, they were also sent to their specific Indian territory. Standing Bear, this guy, this chief, um, had uh, actually he had lost his son in in the actual trial of retreat and trying not to, to fight or do anything. Um, lost his son and hoped to bury him in uh, in Nebraska, where they re- originally were. Got arrested. Public opinion was not happy about that. Got freed and then ultimately put his people on you know. I guess you could say reservations. Uh, they basically brought them back home, but didn't give them back their property. It's all a shit show, to be quite honest with you. But ultimately, that's just what's going to happen for the most part during. That's just a generalization. It goes so much deeper of Rutherford B. Hayes' Indian policy in America. The final domestic thing I'm going to get to before we go into the the foreign policy and then the timeline ultimately is going to be. Um, his his money policy, his economic policy. You see, Hayes, you know, he had been through it. He had been through the 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 panic of eighteen seventy three, the the problems that occurred uh, during eighteen seventy three, when basically the country was financially in debt. Like I said before, during the Civil War, and since then, the national debt has increased four thousand percent. The country was basically working off of greenbacks which is fiat paper money and that's basically money that's not backed by anything it's gold or silver it's basically just on the promise that hey i will pay this off in the future or this is going to be something that's going to be worth something in the future you know it's basically just blank checks that you don't know where they're coming from and unfortunately um greenbacks were such a large um large were just dominant within the actual financial markets that it made things very difficult inflation rose for the most part you know and, and, and that's the thing if you have more money than you actually have gold or something that's going to back it inflation is going to occur you may have more money but prices are also going to rise up to go along with it you know it's it's, it's, it's like the, it's, it's just it's 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 insane you know that's just generally and this is just basic economics you know, it's like every time you try and raise the minimum wage, you know, it's not going to make things cheaper. You may have more money, but, you know, it's not going to change the reality that, excuse me, you know, you don't have more gold. You don't have anything that's it's going to be backed by and people just, you know, prices will rise because of it and nothing's going to change ultimately. And that's just the unfortunate reality. And ultimately, Hayes himself was a very gold standard person. He wanted the United States, which at that point, um, really, he just wanted them to first and foremost stop uh, handing out all these, you know, greenbacks, and really just wanted to stop fiat payment in dollars, and wanted us to go back to reach some semblance of stability. You know, and everyone was kind of for it because, you know, there's, there's still economic problems within the country itself, and and the people who you know felt the real brunt of it ultimately were farmers and northeastern businessmen so they were basically just like you know what we're cool we're gucci let's go back to the the gold standard you have to understand you know people saw this much more than just actual objective terms a lot of these people were like this is the fight of america you know this is you know we are in a moral uh war than an economic war the struggle between honest money and dishonest money and you know, because a lot of people are basically like, if we're for for specky money, then you're not doing things for for the justice of people. You know, a lot of people saw themselves as that. People still see themselves in that particular perspective. Was, I mean, you've seen it. I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of the recent presidents, uh, <laughs> uh, especially Obama, kind of just like really uh, he didn't push that specifically like fiat money or anything but you know the moralistic standard that we're doing this and it's going to be this is yeah yeah but you know there's there's a reality that has to go along with it um notably with like his health care reforms and whatnot which are really you know good ideas but really hard to functionally implement for numerous reasons but i'll get to that when i get to obama and Hayes himself which was kind of funny because he himself was a was a, a, a debtor because um, he had real estate for the most part. So for him, this was um, at the very least not very financially lucrative for his investments. But he he basically was like, okay, let's just gonna do this. So he started along with uh, John Sherman, his treasury uh, secretary, of treasury supported first and foremost 
before he became president, he supported the Specky Resumption Act and basically worked hard for the next majority of his presidency to build up the country's gold supply and restricted a lot of greenbacks uh, in circulation. And ultimately, you know, by near the end of his presidency, uh, paperbacks and actual specky money, even fiat money, uh, they were basically about the same price as gold for the most part. They had met their standard and really brought the country back through financial means. But then there was a bit of a war because... You know, silver was really booming. There was a lot more silver than there were than there was gold. And despite uh, silver being um, at this time about a sixteenth um, to to gold, um, a lot of people were pushing for silver, gold and silver specifically, so that they can have the silver coins uh, within circulation. And a lot of people were basically for like silver standard individuals who wanted to keep the United States out of the gold standard. And it's really just the difference between. You know what's worth more and what's not worth more. I mean, there's a lot more silver and a lot of a whole bunch of silver miners that are really benefiting from this, but you know it's just not worth as much. And you know having different currencies out there and different standards, it's very very difficult. There's a reason why we're still. I don't know. Actually, I don't know if we are on the gold standard to be honest right now. I, it's not in my head at the, at the top of my head right now, but I think we are. Um, ultimately, there was a compromise bill. This bland. Uh, Allison Act, which Hayes tried to veto specifically, um, which required the Secretary of the Treasury to purchase at the market price of two to four million dollars of silver each month, and mint that into silver dollars. So the United States specifically, while basically going back on the gold standard, would have silver dollars within circulation itself, and ultimately the country really financially prospered because of this. So first and foremost, at least in terms of foreign policy, he is not going to be the one who's going to start what would known be known as specifically, I guess you could say, as America's uh, intervention uh, and you know inclination to become an imperial power. Hayes was very off hands for the most part, at the very least, and just wanted people to really do what they wanted to do and tried to do things in terms of just being a civil servant uh, member of basically the, the federal government as, as the president of the United States. He didn't want America to be anything that it wasn't, which is why I tend to have, I guess in some ways, much more respect for presidents uh, akin to Hayes. But that doesn't mean he's going to uh, mess up or not have issues with foreign relations, notably the, the two that, excuse me, um, some books and biographies always detail specifically with Mexico and China. Now, both these things are very, very complicated issues. Um, but first and foremost, when Hayes becomes president, uh, there's bands of, I guess you could say, Mexican outlaws that kept crossing into the United States and causing a whole bunch of different issues with a bunch of border states. Can you just imagine what Texas is probably thinking, like, get these people out of here, you know what I'm saying? And problems just continue to occur. So Hayes himself started to put troops within the southern borders of the United States, which pissed off uh, Porfirio Diaz. He was a Mexican president. I think he would be uh, the, technically a dictator. Um, he would be the dictator well into the new century. And basically just try to stop a whole bunch of these different things happening. And almost war broke out. It's a whole bunch of different things. But ultimately, um, the attacks would really stop. And the outlaws from Mexico, because by 1880, um, Diaz himself was basically like, okay, we should probably help intervene in some meaningful way. And Hayes is like, fucking finally, yeah. So and then basically stop the whole troops, uh, sending troops back down to the southern border. And... The other issue, foreign policy-wise, too, is with Chinese people and Chinese immigration. The Berlin-Game Treaty with China allowed, relatively speaking, um, unrestricted Chinese immigration to the United States. A lot of people were basically like, it's cheap labor, it's going to be good for a lot of people, Republicans, you know how it goes. And ultimately, um, a lot of Chinese laborers came uh, to the country during the, the gold rush, and there was a lot of people. You know, almost 10,000 Chinese laborers would be employed by um, just the, the Pacific Railroad Company for, you know, just the building of the railroads. And again, you know, a lot of these people would afterwards would go into agricultural, urban jobs like factories, um, 
laundry mats i guess you could say the equivalent of laundry mat and just you know they were taking jobs away from people you know on average um, they would they would work on 25 cents of the dollar in comparison to a white worker so a lot of people were not happy you know and they and it, it worked for some people because some of these urban factories and centers um you know could produce goods at much lower rates and undercut a whole bunch of different people which is not helping at all you have to understand that so it made things a lot more difficult um for a lot of certain companies to really spring up and you know monopolies would be created because of this and, and shit like this for the most part where you know you get cheap labor to undercut prices you know so we're still dealing with dealing with problems like this today but it's much more slave labor today than anything else i mean say slave labor back then too basically but you know whole point being a lot of people were not happy with chinese people a whole bunch of different people the great strike of 1877 they got mad people were in california you, know, you want to talk about a progressive state they basically just straight up outlawed in their california constitutional convention in 1878 and basically just said yeah we don't want chinese people here too i mean a lot of their a lot of the things that they did were basically like yeah we're not you're not going to be able to vote you're not going to do anything and even federal courts were like dude you guys are taking this a bit far so you need to chill and ultimately uh hayes had actually vetoed a couple different things that really stopped this and hayes himself uh he's just indifferent to it all really and i think he for the most part attempted to avoid the conflict altogether but ultimately ended up basically saying okay we need to do something about this because a lot of people are not happy and although chinese immigration is kind of slowing down by this particular point in time because china is having a whole bunch of different issues um around this period that you know we need to do something about it so he gets a commission and while he won't be able to functionally really do anything by the end of his presidency it's going to be left up to, to chester a arthur ultimately um the country is on the path to what would be i think the chinese exclusion act uh, by the time he's going to lead the office the only other real notable thing that would actually occur in terms of foreign policy would be the attempt to try and build uh the first attempt really at the uh, panama canal so back then the ideas had actually started with um a french uh builder um a french i guess you could say architect let me let me see if i can pronounce his name right fernandez de la Cepes, i believe his name was and he actually had proposed this idea of a sea level panama canal which was a part of colombia at the time before they, they've had the revolution and fought for their own freedom, yada yada. And um, ultimately, really just wanted to push forward, you know, for trade. Excuse me. Because, uh, you know, it was just going to be much quicker. Things were looking and trending in that direction anyway, so might as well have someone jumpstart it. Now, the United States had some people there. A lot of the American rich capitalist individuals went down there to try and figure out some deals, and they got. Um, the, the government involved in it and Hayes wanted to be a part of it and wanted the, the country to be part of it you know financially speaking let's get the country uh, Gucci um but a lot of the things that Lesepes was doing was not very conducive um ultimately for Hayes and the, the presidency two things happened first off it's a multivariate analysis you have to understand the mindset of a lot of people the United States is very finicky with the french still because you know you remember napoleon the third tried to start a coup during the civil war when he had taken mexico and then you know the, the 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 french influence in a lot of the hispanic countries a lot of people still believe in the monroe doctrine we're not an internationalist nation by any stretch of the imagination we're still a backwater nation in a lot of ways and we don't have a lot of influence although our industrial peak is really rising during this particular point in time which I think is something that, you know, should positively be looked upon for Rutherford B. Hayes in some way, shape, and form is the levels of just advancement that he was able to facilitate with financial improvements, et cetera, et cetera. That being said, um, you know, he was very sus in a lot of ways with a lot of the, the French individuals and ultimately was basically just put his foot down and basically said, this is either going to be an American-controlled canal or we will not have a canal. And there's a lot of tension between the French individuals and the United States. And ultimately, just long story short, because this is a very long story, to be quite honest with you, uh, the canal venture would ultimately fail. 
the Seppies himself would leave and return to France, and, you know, everything just failed. And uh, another attempt at the Panic Canal really wouldn't occur until Big TD himself. So let's get to the relative timeline of Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency. You know, let me let me just explain what will happen during the four years of his presidency. First and foremost, in the very beginning, within a month of his first of his of his only term, actually, uh, he will start withdrawing troops from the South, notably from South Carolina and Louisiana, as a part of the you know eight, the the Compromise of eighteen seventy seven. Now, this divided a lot of the Republican Party in general. They was already divided just with his election, to be quite honest with you, um, ultimately speaking. Um, and ultimately, with his cabinet appointments, um, I, mean, I, I mean, basically, the Republican Party is just like four different groups of ideological individuals and people, the most prominent being the, the moderates and, I guess you could say, the liberal-minded individuals, uh, specifically. And it's around this particular point um, that when they basically leave uh, the, the the sorry when the troops leave the set, uh, the southern territories, um, you know a lot of the Republicans really start disliking Hayes, basically saying you know you can't keep compromising with these people, you know, and and I will and I will give Hayes some relative credit because he actually I think in some attempt to try and compromise with these individuals uh and he tempted to do a lot of things that ulysses did but ulysses was always going to have that moniker of i'm going to i'm the guy that defeated slavery etc cetera, etc cetera. he was always, always going to have some negative connotations towards him in that way you know he's like he's abraham lincoln 2.0 you know and you know with hayes while well, although he fought in the war and specifically actually felt the combat you know there's a kinship there and there's at the very least um you know some strength that hayes had really shown um in a different way than you know grant ultimately was going to to get the benefit of the doubt so you know for for hayes he understood above all else since he physically truly fought in the war got hurt in the war itself and and really was just like we need to stop this fighting ultimately and ultimately was trying to be someone that could be in the middle and i will give him credit that he attempted um, in at least some relative meaningful way to try and be a genuine bipartisan president. So seven months later, after the withdrawal of the troops, a lot of things start happening. Uh, a lot of labor issues really start really occurring, and it's going to continue to grow and grow and grow around this point in time. Meanwhile, a lot of the issues with Mexico are starting to occur. Basically, Red Dead Redemption is is really growing. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the lawlessness that occurs in that particular territory is going to start occurring. And, um, you know, things are just going to escalate, uh, specifically in Mexico, Texas territory, where cowboys, yada, yada, boom, everything is happening. In which Rutherford B. Hayes um, is going to really start pushing forward troops into the southern territory to really calm things down. And, uh, you know, ultimately, Diaz, the president, is basically like, oh my god, you know, but then economic problems really start occurring, in which case, you know, he's going to have to step up and try and do some things. So, midway through his first term, a bunch of things happen. First and foremost, he attempts to push forward genuine civil service reform, like I said before, and a lot of the things that really start occurring really begin here. Now, the second thing is going to be the the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 that's going to occur during this point in time. Now, I will actually probably end up doing a small little episode just on the philosophical and some, some of a bit of an outline of what the actual Great Railroad Strike of 1877 really had happened and occurred. But I'll explain it to you this way. You know, like I said before, with the Chinese Exclusion Act that's going to occur, a lot of this really starts around there. You know, a lot of people were being undercut, economically speaking, and things made it very difficult. Again, it's a multivariate analysis that leads to stuff like this. Chinese people coming in, undercutting, taking jobs. The Panic of 1873 making things very difficult. And ultimately, you know, even in just the greenbacks, not really a gold standard by this particular point in time. A lot of things are occurring. The social economic uh, disparities between groups, uh, the disparity between you know rich people, poor people, everything is really occurring by this particular point in time. 
And it starts with the Pennsylvania Railroad, which is one of the largest railroad companies in the world, had decided to reduce the workers' pay approximately uh, by about 25% um, for several years, um, from like starting with the Panic of 1873. Remember, there's no labor unions or anything like this that are really established or formed by this particular point in time. Most of these are going to really occur in the cities, but railroads across the country start really um occurring or start cutting pay throughout every single great railroad company and a whole bunch of people start you know rising up trying to create unions that get swelled down and then ultimately a lot of people start getting really fed up with a bunch of this stuff and a lot of people start striking and people begin striking in several different places um pennsylvania baltimore like pittsburgh a lot of these places and hayes at the behest of several governors starts sending in troops and while violence didn't really occur at all, to be honest, most of these were actually really peaceful protests. The violence that did occur, the you know, newspapers start, start blasting. Excuse me, would occur in certain places, notably in Baltimore, where a riot actually did uh, occur. But Hayes, not wanting to step on the state's authority, ultimately was like, "Hey, governor, if you want me to send in troops, I'll send in troops." And ultimately, he would eventually send in troops. And to put it plainly, the, the strikes would effectively end after some time where, you know, the federal troops didn't really kill anybody and the workers um, themselves didn't die because of federal troops. Uh, the troops didn't die either. You know, state militias and strikers fought each other and a lot of people died in this really gruesome conflict. And ultimately, while the railroads ultimately won because people went back to work, it really caused a whole bunch of uh, civil service reforms in a lot of ways, in which you know, the, just people blame the railroads for everything, the strikes, the violence, and ultimately, they really forced them to have some semblance of oversight, in which case, even Hayes himself, who's like very hands-off, and he's not a laissez-faire capitalist by any means, but, you know, he's very not... Uh, government influence and I mean, he himself wrote in his diary uh, was like just asking you know can't something be done by the education of strikers by judicious control of the capitalists can we general policy wise smart legislation end or diminish the evil that had occurred following the great railroad strike of uh, 1877 Hayes um ultimately starts beginning um, just implementing a lot of his policies and ultimately really kind of getting his face out there uh, for the most part. Notably, he goes on a tour um, of the South and he pledges, you know, reconciliation, solidarity, and ultimately just like, hey guys, we can work together. We can actually do this together and please work with me and I will work with you despite, you know, a lot of the contention with the South because, you know, the election is still very very fresh in a lot of people's minds literally just happened four months ago or at least the, the the democrats ended their filibuster about literally just four months ago and a lot of the times uh like i said before about civil service reform really begins uh here where hayes goes against conkling which surprises a lot of people the people democrats in the south are like oh okay so the republicans are just kind of going against each other cool um the first real specific i guess you could say nationalized labor union is also going to begin uh, very early in 1878 the knights of labor uh, is going to be the first union to attempt to organize all workers and hopes to establish a, a worker owned factory of systems and you know by the 1880s which i will which i kind of do want to do a smaller episode on the knights of labor actually a really fascinating group that uh, should be given much more um um notoriety uh positive and negative excuse me this is also going to and this is when hayes starts really becoming hayes after the first year where he's kind of just trying to be a little bit hands off as much as he possibly can be even though he's trying to push out a whole bunch of different fires hayes really starts becoming uh the person uh, that's going to really start influencing uh, the country. Within the first four months of 1878, he starts doing a bunch of different things. He starts, um, he signs the U.S. Samoan Treaty, um, which gives basically the United States the right to establish, um, you know, a whole bunch of different coaling stations and naval stations on the port of uh, Pago Pago in, in Samoa. And uh, a lot of people 
you know, are going to have some issues with it, obviously. It just, just seems like, you know, the white man's taking over a whole bunch of different countries and a whole bunch of uh, at different places. But, you know, it is what it is back then. And then Hayes is going to start just basically trying to, to take control and really push for the powers of the executive branch, vetoing the Bland Allison uh, Act, which is initially the act that called for the, the, the creation of the silver coinage, um, which is going to cost the country about $2 million to $4 million per month to create silver coins. He's also going to start trying to limit Chinese immigration or the release attempt to, to, to stop vetoing or he's going to veto, um, sorry, he limits legislation for Chinese immigration specifically, and he wants to actually negotiate things in order to, to curtail some semblance of immigration. This is also around the time, too, I might want to point out that, you know, the country's starting to change a little bit in some ways, um, at least politically speaking. Um, the Democrats really start, the, the House Democrats start an investigation specifically into the election of 1876. And a lot of people are kind of just like, oh, is there something going on here? You know, even Hayes himself, is, uh, most of the, the testimony of, of what we know about Hayes is from his diary. And he actually feared that the investigation might actually, you know, curtail some. You know, you think things are crazy now as of the recording of this um in very early December, you know, it, it's back then, like, you know, Hayes genuinely feared he was just going to be taken out of the presidency and replaced with Tilden. So I'm just saying th- anything can happen, to be quite honest with you. And, you know, the the negative press, ultimately the Republicans looking like they're just fighting with each other and they can't decide on anything. Democrats in the midterm elections of 1878 will have, for the first time, both houses of Congress since basically the Civil War. And this will basically limit Rutherford B. Hayes, genuinely speaking, um, and a lot of the things that he can and cannot do, unfortunately, which is going to basically make the last two years of his presidency uh, difficult in, in terms of him trying to pass some semblance of legislation. Now, early of 1879, uh, the greenback buyback and the recovery of the economy uh, really begins. Hayes allows the resumption of gold payments for Civil War green packs uh, or paper money that's not you know backed by anything. And the this basically just he's just continuing the Specky Act that President Grant had specifically started, uh, which was the whole thing with eighteen in eighteen seventy five. And this is also because uh, the government's gold supply had grown, um, and with silver coins increasing, the economy really uh, began to recover. And that by 1879, the, the the whole Civil War bonds that the country had ultimately would be retired. So early in 1879, though, Hayes is going to basically get a lot of the things his way. He really works with some of the Democrats and some of the Republicans and ultimately really attempts in some meaningful way to play both of them in, in, in a lot of ways, politically speaking. And I hate politics, but, you know, the Senate will approve his customs house and pointing with basically just the Democrats siding with Hayes, and which I think is really interesting. And ultimately... Um, is going to be at least the first steps in some genuine um, civil service reform in this country's history. The other big thing that's going to start really uh, happening would be the Army Appropriations Bill, which I had talked about earlier, um, um, which had these riders that the Democrats kept pushing in that would stop them from uh, putting troops or uh, special help at uh, polls and poll watchers to protect voters and whatnot, which Hayes kept vetoing many, many times. And ultimately, after quite some time, um, with the House unable to, and House and I think the Senate unable to get their two thirds majority, Hayes continues to veto all these basically bills. And ultimately, a bill will be signed, in which case they will basically um, figure out how many troops the country can have without restricting the rights of people at specific polls, and notably in the South. Um, there will be a whole bunch of appropriations bills on top of that as well, which um, were because of uh, the Democrats' failed attempt at the Army Appropriations Bill, I believe. Um, this is also around the time, too, at the beginning of 1880, when Hayes is basically trying to figure out what's going to happen uh, with the, the canal in, in you know Central America and all that stuff that's going to effectively happen. Now, 
midway through about 1880, there's a bunch of different things that are going on specifically. The country, I guess you could say, is um, in a weird spot politically speaking. The South, um, because the Democratic Party is also very split as well. Um, You have Northern Democrats that are more akin to what I would say are the modern interpretation of, of the Democratic Party today. And then you have the Deep South, which is deeply relatively speaking um in some many ways conservative um in many ways a whole bunch of different things to be quite honest with you it's really fascinating just to to study the south during this particular point in time but the democratic party um was in a complicated place and for better or worse the republican party was changing uh, in a positive way in a positive direction that was looking like things are actually on the up and up and you know hayes wasn't the most popular person but at the very least it showed that okay you know what he's not a crazy dictator and he's not gonna do anything and all he does is just try to give people the things and abilities necessary to implement personal success um and i think they'd rather have that than you know the the presidency of so say buchanan or the overwhelming you know laissez-faire federal government in terms of the corruption that grants presidency ultimately would uh, would occur and hayes openly said from the get-go he will not go for a second term and this kind of confused a lot of people within the republican party because you know he, if he had a second term things might be better, things might be different and for rutherford b hayes there's a bunch of different things um you can look at but just like a lot of people and just like a lot of people, uh, especially a lot of the previous presidents, he's just like, I just want to retire. I just want to go home. I just want to do my thing. You know, he made the made the promise back in 1876 that he would only serve one term, and ultimately decided in May that he's only going to run one term, and effectively just allows the Republican Party to try and figure out who is going to be his successor, and. The, the Republican Party themselves, I'll just briefly talk about it, but I won't go in depth and detail until I get to James A. Garfield, is really between, surprisingly, uh, former Ulysses, President Ulysses S. Grant, who's kind of just like, eh, 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 but there's real, a real push in order for him to get it. And then James G. Blaine, uh, the congressman from, uh, um, from Maine, I believe. And then uh, Congressman James A. Garfield just kind of gets thrown in at this particular time. He's head of the um, chairman of the convention rules committee, and um, Ohio. He's a but he's also ironically another, um, I believe, congressman or senator, um, a congressman. I think at, at this point from Ohio specifically, and uh, it's funny because uh, Treasury Secretary John Sherman ultimately is just like, all right. I like this guy. He's well. He's they're kind of homeboys, um, but ultimately James A. Garfield's going to get the the nomination. He's going to be. He had another dark horse candidate uh, by this point in time. So Rutherford B. Hayes for him, he goes on a, a big tour. He tours the country specifically and tours the West Coast. Um, goes to the Rocky Mountains. Um, he traveled with William Tecumseh Sherman, who helped organize the trip. And he gets to journey across the country and goes to the states. You know, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, goes to Portland, San Francisco, and then he comes home and casts his vote for the election of 1880. But anyways, uh, the the Republicans ultimately will choose James A. Garfield. The the Democratic Party will choose um, Winfield S. Scott. And then you know the election occurs. James A. Garfield will be elected by a very narrow popular margin but a very comfortable electoral margin which is you know a big thing because this is just going to end up you know okay cool you know like this is a much more fair election not really that much con- not hotly contested it's very clear y'all won and the rutherford b hayes is going to effectively just enjoy the last couple months of his presidency as his presidency was winding down he spent a lot more time with his family Lemonade Lucy was in full bore and full display. Um, and, you know, he really just set things up for her, James A. Garfield, to effectively have a hopefully a successful presidency. Um, 
and really just wanted to enjoy the last couple months before he would retire and ultimately he will really just retire retire um hayes is going to do some stuff with with china very very briefly um before going full bore um into retirement but he's basically just setting up plans and he's setting up things for what he wants to do in his retirement um and ultimately uh he's just going to attend james a garfield's inauguration and he and lucy will leave the white house and return to ohio at a uh, spiegel grove hayes in retirement is going to do quite a bit uh, quite a few things to be quite honest with you um, he's going to join this thing. It's this military order of the Loyal Legion. Um, it's basically just, you know, a whole bunch of different people to support, um, you know, former troops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like this, this brotherhood in a lot of ways. He's actually going to be president of it one, at one point. And he really just stays home, occasionally traveling um, from time to time. Notably, he's going to end up traveling, uh, I believe, to Bermuda uh, with his daughter um, after some time. For the most part, he really develops and just... And this is going to be very brief because he will die in 1893. But he's just basically going to follow politics and continue education reform while giving the, the occasional snippet every now and then. You know, in his retirement, he wanted to promote the welfare, the happiness of his family, his state, his country, etc. He wanted, he wanted to be the example that people could follow i wanted to be this egalitarian individual and supported a whole bunch of different social causes and ultimately he ended up really helping and trying to push for um whatever whatever power the ex-president could a universal tax supported uh, education and that you know he basically pushed forward a whole bunch of different social programs and improved a whole bunch of different social programs for people to get opportunities in grade school um, in graduate school, usually, basically using a whole bunch of different money, uh, of his own money to this, that he, uh, put forward to help educational funds for blacks and whites, and again, you know, he's not a racist, um, but, you know, he, uh, I think he believes that, you know, there's, they're not socially equal black people and white people, fundamentally, um, but at the very least, he fought for, um, educational rights of all races and specifically of poor school districts and you know, he's a firm believer that if they're educated they can actually improve their particular status you know and a lot of people wouldn't be as intolerant as they as they functionally were you know he was a big believer of the you know the ideas of lincoln and you know thomas jefferson and you know just functionally and fundamentally everyone's birthrights um He's also pushing forward with a lot of his money, uh, influencing to the best of his ability, <laughs> um, some prison reform and reduction of crime, you know, and really put forth uh, a lot of that. It's notable, too, that he's, he's keeping an eye on politics and he's keeping an eye on the country in a lot of ways because, you know, some presidents will, will go and see him. Um, he, like, he saw William McKinley, who was a rising political star within the Republican Party, and he actually liked Grover Cleveland, um, because they're, they're basically kind of like the same person, just on different, um, political parties for the most part, um, except Grover Cleveland's much more of a, of a, of a hard line, and I think much more, uh, you know, aggressive and passionate in a lot of ways, and a little more outspoken, but Hayes is basically just seeing a lot of the things that are happening, um, you know the, the the gap between the rich individuals and the laborers which he saw before with the whole great railroad strike was only becoming so much more aggressively apparent um that you know because even he himself was was relatively speaking very well off but even he was just like why does jp morgan have so much money you know like <laughs> you know or, uh, I, I think he might have been around this particular point in time but the whole point being that you know there he started understanding that you know laissez-faire capitalism really isn't functionally the way to go because people will be influenced by the dollar which is why it's a difficult conundrum in a lot of ways between people who excuse me um you know there's like two ends of the political spectrum there's communism and there's laissez-faire capitalism you know and or socialism and laissez-faire capitalism and both of them, on both ends, are very, very terrible. You know, there's no checks and balances for either one of them. Both lead to aggressive levels of corruption, although laissez-faire capitalism is much more mal like tolerable, 
barely, but tolerable. And he basically started really putting forth, like, yeah, this is not good. You know, it's really unregulated uh, competition that's just going to start creating a whole bunch of, you know, different monopolies and corporations. And, you know, in a lot of his diaries, it's really, just really important than to him specifically. Um, a lot of these corporations being very predatory in a lot of ways and ultimately really um, push forward a whole bunch of different things. Um, at the very least, in terms of trying to, you know, really be a good individual in person and be, you know, the most outstanding individual that's going to help um, promulgate um, a lot of positive influence within the country itself. Uh, unfortunately, soon after, though, in June of 1889, Lucy would have a stroke, his wife, and she would soon die and just make well, Rutherford B. Hayes a broken man for quite some time. And although uh, his only daughter, Fanny, named after his sister um uh they both basically his sister or his daughter basically just uh um helped him get through all of the hard times and they uh um would always travel as much as possible and on one specific trip um uh he would actually be in a hotel room or something like that uh, rutherford ba's would actually uh suffer a heart attack and uh, returning one of, on one of these trips, I think visiting Cleveland specifically in early January of 1893, and he was able to live long enough specifically um, to reach Spiegel Grove, where family members would come in. His last words being of his wife that, I know when I'm going, where Lucy is, and Rutherford B. Hayes will die on January 17th, 1893. He will be buried next to his wife Lucy. So what is rutherford b hayes because i think he's a just like a lot of these men a lot of these people a lot of these presidents you know it's not you know he, he's he's an individual in my mind where you know it's it makes it very apparent you know to me that you know just because you're part of one political party or ideology doesn't mean you're entirely that person you know like, it's impossible, in my personal view, how one person can be a part of something. Like, for instance, just because, you know, like, say I vote Democrat or I vote Republican, that I am woefully and functionally and fundamentally a part of all the creeds that the Republican and Democratic parties are a part of, um, doesn't necessarily mean that I am this or I am that, you know. Just because, like, I might have uh, a lot more conservative things does not mean that I'm not liberal-minded individual or something like that you know what i'm saying there's a whole bunch of different parameters that a lot of people kind of put people in in terms of like if i'm this then i'm clearly this and i'm clearly that when i'm definitely not if that makes any sense you know it's really you put people into these camps and it's really difficult to ascertain um th just who they are as individuals and people and even back then you know these individuals and people are very you know interesting they're very complicated and convoluted you know most people would say rutherford b hayes was a moderate you know probably leaning towards conservatism but at the very same end of the spectrum you know he's by the end of his presidency kind of in a lot of ways um a liberal you know at least our modern interpretation of a liberal and you know back then he's probably um a little more left than the moderates in my personal view for numerous reasons ultimately um just personally speaking, because uh, at the very least he's advocating and compromising a whole bunch of economic policies and not blinking an eye, really. <laughs> it's complicated. You know, and when you do these episodes and you start really trying to understand these people, you know, at their core of who they are, you know, we're not all perfect beings. You know, we're not perfect by any semblance of the imagination, and it's just so much more complicated, and I think we even give credit for and credence for Rutherford B. Hayes is a very simple but also complicated president and individual in terms of who he is and legacy wise, you know. It's like it is complicated because like you know, you know when you think of people who who you know are part of like the Underground Railroad, you probably have an idea and a perspective that they might be in some way, shape and form you know not prejudiced or like they're all equal in every single way but then it's like okay rutherford b hayes i don't fully believe believes in that wholeheartedly i think a lot of his life i think he believes in equality 
but I don't believe he thinks people are equal, if that makes any sense. You know, and I think he really believed in that. And I think he sees that with especially just, just his views on how he viewed uh, the socioeconomic differences between classes and um, just in difference with certain issues that came with, you know, uh, supporting black people, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's complicated. There's a, it's a whole different, it's a whole issue. It's a whole bunch of different things. And he's just a complicated person and a complicated individual. Do I think he's a good man? Um, that depends. You know, what is good? What is bad? You know, I, I, I go all over the place, really. You know, I think he's just kind of milk toast. I think, you know, like, I think he wants to do good things. And I think, um, you know, he's a good person in some ways, shape and form. I think he has some good qualities and characteristics that might make people think he's a good man. But, you know, like, good men. Like, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I ultimately and functionally, after really thinking about it, come down to the conclusion that he is a good man. And I think good men are men that are open to change, are open to uh, different perspectives. And I think... Like, Abraham Lincoln wasn't anyone that was going to change his mind. Or wasn't someone that was like, I'm not going to try and stop slavery. And I think by the end of his own presidency, you know, I think... And I'm not saying he thought down to black people. You know, there might have been some prejudice, but that clearly went away. You know, I think men like Abraham Lincoln learned and learned to be good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And at least in terms of a racial perspective, he was just like this has to change this has to stop we need to stop being like this and and for rutherford b hayes at least in terms of you know that level of equality i don't know if he ever reached that specifically but then again i don't think hayes ever looked at it that way i think hayes probably looked at things much more of a in terms of like an economic sense you know it's much more apparent that you know black people uh, unfortunately just suffer because you know they might be slightly inferior but for the most part you know it's if you just educate them etc cetera, etc cetera, then you know they things might be different you know and so i'm going off on a bit of a tangent here but <laughs> i guess my whole point is um people are complex Hayes is a human being and a person you know and and you know, you read some of his writings, and you kind of just come to a weird conclusion where it's just like, I, I don't know if you mean what you say, and I don't know if what you say is what you mean, if that makes any sense. You know, I, I read some of his writings, and some of the things that I, I tend to believe that he believes tend to come from just how he perceives a lot of the socioeconomic differences really that's just much more so i'm not saying he's a liar i'm just saying that you know you might say something but i don't know if you actually you know really believe it you know like his treatment of other races specifically um other than you know white people tend to be really negatively looked upon in some way shape or form but that was really no different than a lot of individuals back then in fairness you know hayes was just like a lot of these individuals and people that are basically like you should probably try and act like what might constitute back then uh, just the ideas of a white man or a white society but i think for him it was just more about success is just try to be rich you know and, and it involves certain characteristics and certain traits and certain things that you know in this country to succeed you know you need to speak english you need to you know like native americans you got to assimilate within the white culture etc cetera, etc cetera, you know and 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 you know it's just it's just it's just he believed in that ultimately and it, and it makes things really difficult and it really clouds um what someone believes and what someone doesn't believe you know when i think of hayes i kind of i kind of think of him as like a blank slate in a lot of ways um you know like abraham lincoln had personality andrew Jam andrew johnson and personality even grant had a specific personality but hayes is is he's like just someone that's really hard to read sometimes i mean he's just a shy apprehensive person and i and again i haven't read his entire diary or anything i've only read very few sections um most of the, just most of the important sections really but a lot of his it's hard which is why i think like when his diary comes out and it just gives you a completely different perspective of him 
after reading just you know two of the biographies and some sections about him and some research papers about him you know i it's difficult to really assess him you know because one thing says one thing his actions say another thing and his personality says another thing you know and that's just the complexity of human nature and human beings in general don't get me wrong but you know with hayes it's even more apparent you know like i can at live like if if grant had his biography which he had basically written at least there's some semblance of continuity you know i can see his perspective and you know with, with hayes it's just like i i don't know i think that's just my problem i don't know what he believes in, and i don't know if what he says is true and i i can't really ascertain one way or another um some of the aspects of who he is and his, during his, just during his presidency whether they were good or bad or with good intention or or not so you for, so for hayes i think with a lot of pre, a lot of people and a lot of historians tend to really look at him in terms of at the very least an attempt at an objective way at the very least in much more just like he did this and he did that rather than you know the ulterior motives left and right which is why i think it's really interesting when i read some of his books and just you know read about him in general and ultimately they just see he's just a simple man he's a good man and that you know he just did this and he did that you know and i think i think that's just how biographies and how history has looked at him but i think it's just more complicated personally and i'm trying to figure out the complicated aspects of nature of rutherford b hayes so if i'm just going to look at him objectively and relatively speaking honestly i actually think he was a fine president i think he set up the republican party in a good way i think he was very relatively speaking politically savvy i think he did a lot of good things i also think he did a lot of bad things but a lot of those bad things can be attributable to just basically any single president during and basically around up until probably 1960 or 1970 you know like like a lot of presidents have done bad things you know like it's just it is what it is you know fdr uh, imprisoned my grandpa for four years of his life so you know it's, it's this country is not perfect but the ideas are are pretty sound and they're pretty kick-ass in my personal view but you know it's it's complicated and i, and I don't i don't play that game of you know oppression and whatnot you know it's not how people should conduct themselves and just in my view and i don't know sorry i'm going off on a bit of a tangent here ultimately but I guess what I'm trying to say is with Hayes, you know, with a lot of the negative things that happened, um, you know, there it's just what it was back then, you know? And if, if hypothetically the tables were turned and for some reason the native population had the majority and superseded uh, the white population by an overwhelming amount, had better equipment and technology, they'd be doing the exact same thing. And people that want to argue it, it, it's it's a foolhardy argument in my personal view does that mean it's right or wrong no it's not right at all but whole point being that to make that uh your some of the basis of your argument but just me pointing that out just shows the reality of human nature ultimately it's just my point of view and things aren't perfect and they definitely could have done a lot better um but for the most part <coughs> I think Hayes' presidency ultimately represents an attempt to uh, just find some stability for the first time since the Civil War. And I think once, you know, James A. Garfield becomes president, things are kind of settled in a lot of ways. Political divisiveness is just only going to increase and become much more, much more power, like potent. At the very least, it's very clear that both sides have a voice and ultimately both sides uh, will have their own perspectives, obviously, but both sides, you know, Democrats, Republicans, North and South, at the very least, are heard, and, you know, things are set, ultimately, for the next several decades of this country's history, which are very, very complicated, very, very important to the creation, and ultimately, you know, it's the, like the next 20 years, once Hayes leaves office, is going to set us up to really become borderline and imperial power both technological advancements and uh economic prosperity that's going to occur because largely because of hayes's presidency and to end this really long final tangent that i'm going on i will say this 
for Hayes to basically start his presidency the way that he did <clears throat> in such a contested election that, you know, a lot of people, and I think history um, has looked a little more favorably on Hayes in some ways, in shape and form. Um, for him to come out of that basically as, you know, someone who's just like, well, he's just going to be this guy who's going to do this and do that and not really do anything, you know, I mean, I've, I've made the point earlier that he kind of reminds me of like Joe Biden this year in a lot of ways and, excuse me, and in some parts that's true. Um, the main difference is, you know, he's not almost an 80 year old dementia ridden man and you know i think even he surprised a lot of the republican party who had you know when he was first elected that a lot of things that he was going to end up doing was going to be for the benefit of the republican party but within three years he's basically kind of dismantling the republican party uh, in a lot of ways and both building them uh, breaking them down and then you know basically building them back up and it's quite strange and interesting, uh, I guess is what I'm trying to say, which is why he's very different to Mr. Joe Biden himself. Um, look, you know, men are very complicated and people are very complicated. Men and women are very complicated, but people are very complicated. And Rutherford B. Hayes is an enigma, a bit of as, as a president. But I will say this, I think in four years, he may be one of the few individuals who, you know, trying to help the country come out of an economic, you know, panic, trying to deal with the rising unions, the rising disparities that ultimately he's not going to really fix. But he sees the issues and the problems ultimately that are occurring. And he does set some things up at an attempt at civil service reform. And ultimately, you know, really changes the country as the country was really leaning and kind of in a lot of ways going towards, you know, southern supremacy and southern dominance where the southern states are going to start dictating a lot of the things for the northern states. Rutherford B. Hayes is the individual that really, in a lot of ways, saves this off and really pushes forward, you know, the Republican agenda, whatever your opinion is of the Republican agenda at this particular point in time. But really, I guess what I'm trying to get at is is that, you know, he's a contested individual. He's he's someone that won his election in such a uh, really slimy, not only say slimy, because, because he really wasn't a part of it, uh, at the very least from what I've read. But for the most part, in a very just you know this would set this country back hundreds of years specifically for the black population uh, with a compromise of 1877 to make it at the very least the federal government seem like it's actually going to allow people to have their rights allow people to do their things and at the very least attempt to not you know misuse the taxpayer dollars in some meaningful way and, you know, some people might have a negative interpretation of that. You know, there's a lot of people that I know um, that basically are kind of just like, I don't trust the federal government at all, and I don't like people at all that are trying to make the federal government, you know, appealing in any meaningful way. I'd rather have someone that, at the very least, does what his job is supposed to do. Let's promote the, the personal freedoms of individuals, to not supersede the rights of individuals, checks and balances to a certain extent. And you know what? Just let people be. You know, and I, and I tend to like those presidents a little bit more. So if I can give you my exact final thoughts, I think he ultimately is a bit of a surprising president. I think I think he for everything that was piled on him and for the rough start that he would have at the beginning of his presidency, he turned out okay. That's honestly my, my, my final assessment, really, on Rutherford B. Hayes. I think, he, I think he's someone that has a lot of characteristics and qualities of a good man. And I think he's someone, ultimately, that will fail a lot of people. He failed the black people in the South, unfortunately, um, just with the Compromise of 1877. But he's also one that had to deal with a lot of political issues, a lot of political difficulties throughout his presidency with two houses of democratic or 
the, the both houses of Congress going to the Democrats and just his own party, and the fact that he got some things done while trying to promote the liberties of individuals, I can't fault him for that. Now we'll give him credit where credit is due. So Rutherford B. Hayes is an okay president, and I think he did the best that he could in these trying times. And yeah. Thank you guys for listening. And if you guys like, listen. If you don't, eat biscuits. Enjoy.